I'm going to press the screen share button. Can you all see my screen? Awesome. Okay. Oh, we got one more person just joined. Lindsay, welcome. You snuck in right in the nick of time. If anyone else sees someone pop into the waiting room and they see a notice and I'm talking, just try to wave me down. Or Peter, maybe you can, you can help out there too. I'm going to turn off the screen. Okay, so hi guys, my name's Chris and thanks so much for coming to this uh, workshop and training here today about AI. Um, I am a artist and a photographer with a background in communications and marketing and I'll tell you a little bit more about my bio and how I got here um, later today. Um, but I just wanted to um, welcome everyone here. Uh, Peter Bittner is here with us today. Um, you'll see his smiling face there in his what looks like a podcast studio. Um, Peter's a, a professor at UC Berkeley, and him and I are um, co-teaching. I'm his, his TA for a six-part um, uh, workshop on the same theme, and um, we do that immediately after this one today. So we're having um, week two of our six-week workshop later today, and he is a world leader in this kind of stuff. He's excellent at online teaching. He's um, runs a, a company called the Upgrade.ai specifically for communicators and marketers. And he's going to be helping us out today specifically when we get to the kind of text prompting and prompt engineering parts of what we're talking about today. So, Peter, do you just want to um, say a couple of words and introduce yourself? Sure thing. Yeah. Thanks for the intro, Chris. Really excited to be here and meet you all. I've been teaching at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism in the new media program there for the last eight years. Uh, I'm an alum of the program and my background's originally in journalism. So while I was in grad school there, I was playing around with lots of virtual reality and augmented reality tech, drones. And I've been teaching and lecturing since graduation there on and off for yeah the last eight years or so. The last five or so is when AI first started to bounce around the hallways, right? At the Graduate School of Journalism. And that's, really probably the earliest encounter that I had with it was a syllabus that was handed to me by one of my mentors there who was my graduate advisor. And I was like, what the heck is this? You know, it was so early then there was mainly just kind of pre-baked landing pages and video demos for most of the AI, you know, platforms and products, if you could even call them that they were super rudimentary and my how times have changed, right? I mean, this last year, uh, I taught a couple different classes and you know, most of the curriculum, most of the syllabus was, you know, filled with generative AI specifically um, for, you know, communications professionals and journalists, creatives. Uh, and that's really who I serve typically in my courses. I also do consulting. I write a weekly free newsletter uh, with kind of headline round roundups and analyses and, and interviews with thought leaders, including AI founders and yeah, some top voices. So I really like to play in this space. Uh, I connected with Chris through a program through the Google News Initiative, actually, uh, where we were in a, an accelerator for our various media ventures, right, and kind of startups. And so we linked up and we're having a blast. So it's it's great to be here. I am Chris's TA today. So we have been sort of trading off and collaborating and yeah, it's going great. You're really privileged to have Chris here in the pilot seat, though. He is truly one of the most knowledgeable people that I've run into in this. So, you know, all self-taught, just such an experimenter and tinkerer. And yeah, I'm looking forward to learning from Chris this session, too. I know he's got a few things up his sleeve that I haven't heard yet. So um, thanks for bringing up those words, experimenting and tinkering, because they are very important words to me. You know, a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about has existed for months or weeks or days, not just the tools themselves, but the techniques and how to use them and stuff. And we're all just kind of figuring it out together, which is why I do encourage the kind of community-based learning and, um, connecting with other creative professionals and stuff. Um, the Google news initiative that Peter mentioned, I'd love to flag that for you guys. And we can talk more about it later. If you have any 
media related or journalism adjacent project that you're thinking about or working on or one for your clients, I highly recommend this program. It's free. They take you under their wing. They put you in with an amazing cohort of people. I've got 30 colleagues now that are on the same learning journey as I am. And they, they support you. It was a really, really great program. So Google News Initiative, if you're not familiar with it, um, if you have a great idea, it is um, not that challenging to get in. It's competitive, but not that challenging. Um, yeah. So, um, okay, guys, I want to do a quick round of intros, and I feel like this is important. So I'd like for folks to say their name and the organization that they represent. I'd like for you to just quickly say if you got any AI experience at all so we can kind of level set and see where everyone is and one thing you want to get out of today. This shouldn't take more than 30 seconds per person. If you want to opt out, that's fine, but I encourage you to do so. And um, I'll take a volunteer. Hey, Eric, thanks for putting your face on. <laughs> um, someone want to go first? I'll go. Thank you. Uh, so Steve Fisher. I've uh, known Chris since 2008, seven, Gnome Dex. It's been a long, um, so always followed your career and just love what you do. And um, I love you're taking this on. I work for, I, I work for a big consulting firm, but I also have the Revolution Factory, which is a global maker space and innovation hub. So I'm a futurist and doing a lot of work with generative AI as a designer. I think for me, the one thing I'd like to get out of this is really like I'm lost in mid journey and I'm lost in a lot of these tools. And as a creative, how do I get the most out of these as well? I've been playing with a lot of GPT and LLM stuff, but really it's the, the artistic side of me that I really want to learn that how to use and, and to get the right things out of it. That's what mm -hmm. I'd like to get. Oh. That's me. Next. You're on mute, Chris. <laughs> Those were the things I was talking about. <laughs> um, Mid Journey is my favorite AI tool, and we'll definitely cover some of that today. I just completed a really cool project for Wikipedia and Wikimedia. Their executive team was doing an offsite retreat, and they wanted to envision some different future directions and make some strategic decisions around it. And so they gave me this concepting and visioning brainstorming project and it was awesome totally unique i never heard of anything like it before and i'll, I'll walk you guys through that later but mid journey is definitely on the list who else wants to go now david sure so i'm david hool i'm a professional futurist i've been so for about 19 years written 14 books about the future traveled all around the world uh, and spoken in all six continents. And uh, my interest is, you know, I write a newsletter. So I obviously have been writing online for about 18 years and I've written those books. So I've interacted with um, uh, basically from a writing point of view, you mm -hmm. know, taking my stuff and Tyler D. Chardin's, for example, and, and, and comparing them through chat GPT. But so I'm really interested in, because there's a project that I'm working on relative to climate change uh, on, on the visual tools to, to create great art. Uh, Cause I've, I've only interacted with it uh, from a, from a writing point of view. So that's why I'm here is to learn how to create great visuals with it. Um, I was talking a little bit about like prototyping and concepting and, uh, and it's one of my favorite things to do in mid journey. And uh, it's one of the, themes that I was exploring for a while right near the beginning was a lot of like uh, near term future type explorations and a lot of the, the I hit on this term solar punk for a while and I hit on regenerative agriculture and I was working a whole bunch of different visualizations inside mid journey around the themes of um, solar punk living kind of post apocalyptic solar futures and um, yeah so we can talk more about that I'd love to show you some of that and hear about what you're up to thank you who's up next also, I'd like to welcome Daniela, um, my assistant slash chief of staff who just joined us. She's a Spanish speaking um, virtual assistant I've been working with for a couple months and I invite her to join all these workshops. So, yeah, thanks for coming, Daniela. Is she AI or is she real? She's I had to ask, I had to ask. We'll let her show her face when she's ready. <laughs> right on, nice to meet you, Daniela. Thanks for being here. What's up? I'll go next. Thank you. Um, 
I'm Leslie Bolt. I have my own communications company in uh, southwestern British Columbia. Um, I do a lot of media relations, writing, communications strategy, and I'm often asked by people if I, I'm worried AI is going to replace me. Um, I'm not. Uh, but at the same time, I know almost nothing. I've played around with Jack, chat GPT occasionally to do first drafts of letters to the editor, that kind of thing. And I tried to generate a communications plan yesterday. It wasn't very good. And um, so I'm just here to learn some of the basics and uh, sort of understand what tools are available, how I can use them. And I also just want to be able to, at a very basic level, competently speak to some of these issues with others. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, that's awesome. Who's up next? I just put communications plan and basic tools there for you. Susie, you're up next. Hi, I'm Susie Gardner. Also go way back with Chris. It's been a while. Um, I work for a BC, technically BC uh, web dev company that's been around a long time. <clears throat> and I've been using AI uh, quite successfully for things like research and writing and code review and um, you know textual content, um, largely in support of, of my clients. Um, but I'm looking for more information on how to use the creative side and, and with image generation, particularly around web design, um, but also uh, specifically for illustrations. Again, mostly to support clients, but also my, my own personal projects. Um, and, and I found the text stuff very intuitive and the image stuff not at all. So I'm keen to learn, Chris. Cool. Um, I... Probably, well, there's a lot of image stuff coming up here today amongst people about what they want to learn. And I have some of these things on my list. And so I think I'll probably end up walking us through three kind of variants on that today. Dolly, which I've been using not necessarily to make art, but Dolly's a great one for having it like prompt interfaces and diagrams and stuff like that. You're like, give me a web design that has a web design homepage for a company that has five sub pages and a feature section on the homepage. And um, that would be a way I'd use Dolly is to start to comp out web page stuff. Whereas the mid journey tool, I'm using that a lot more for the art and concept art and things like that. So I may um, prompt chat GPT's Dolly to give me a wireframe interface. And then once I'm happy and iterate on that, go into mid journey and start prompting some header images and stuff like that and bring those into the, the thing. And then there's a third tool that I love that I'm gonna show you guys today called Ideogram. And I like it, the, I like it, I use it for logos specifically. It's the best tool I found for understanding text, uh, like, like putting text into images. Um, it still is a little bit challenging, um, but it's, uh, it's better than Dolly and it works. I've been able to generate a bunch of logos for a bunch of projects with it. Um, so we'll show you that there today as well. Who's next? Jessica. I'll go. Uh, my name is Jessica Graychick. I am in Victoria, BC, and uh, I've been a copywriter for most of my career um, in various channels and agencies and freelance and radio and all kinds of things. Um, and I've messed around a little bit with MidJourney and ChatGBT, and I am, you know, a little, you know, concerned that <laughs> it's going to come for my job. Um, so I want to learn how to use it and to, you know, do my job better and... Um, yeah, just use it to make my work more futuristic, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do want to cover the whole, like, is it coming from my job thing? And, and we probably will get to that right after the intros. But like, on one hand, I'm a little less optimistic than Peter. Peter in his class last week was like assuring all these journalists, like, yo, 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 you guys are fine. And you're here in my workshop and everything's going to be cool. And it's not the people, you're not going to lose your job to AI. It's going to be losing your job to people who know how to use AI. So you're learning it and stuff. Well, I'm watching a bloodbath as AI eats one industry after another, specifically creative arts. Yeah. Um, that being said, I think there are a lot of opportunities there. And that's obviously what we're going to talk about. And I'm exploring. I don't think that AI is like the panacea and is going to save the world. And I don't think we can pretend it's going to go away and bury our heads in the sand. Obviously, the, the, the response is somewhere in the middle. And so I call that middle area developing an AI mindset or running alongside these tools and trying to figure out what the fuck is going on with them and stuff, you know, and like, I, I, I try to let folks know too, like, I'm not necessarily going to ask you to 
uh, use GPT to output your writing product that you do then sell to your client as a writer. I want to get you to use AI inside your studio to become a better writer and to uh, deliver better writing ultimately in the end and or document your work and or promote yourself or connect with other partners and people and stuff. And so there's all of these like non-finished work product uses for AI inside studios. And that's what I've been experimenting with quite a bit. So um, great. I hope we cover all that for you as well. Who's next? Eric. Thanks. Uh, I'm Eric Enotam. I'm the CEO of This Fish. So we're a, a software AI company based in Vancouver, basically helping to digitize the global seafood industry. We do have some data scientists on staff. So we're using computer vision for automated inspection, crunching through our you know, our customers' data using machine learning algorithms and that sort of thing. We've also even played with large language models to do like SQL programming. So it wasn't that great. Um, in terms of today, I'm kind of interested more on the marketing stuff, uh, just looking at maybe hiring marketing staff and wondering what we could use to help automate it and maybe lower our, like maybe not have to hire somebody full-time, but maybe part-time and bring some automated tools in. Uh, and then... Um, I'm also a former uh, journalist uh, and author, and I, I sit on uh, the board of directors for Access Copyright. So that's Canada's collective copyright agency, which has been doing a lot of litigation uh, around copyright. And there are a lot of concerns about uh, the la large language models, basically, you know, stealing copyright from authors. So I'm, I'm kind of here for, to learn a little bit more of the creative industry with that kind of hat on my head as well. So. Well, hey, man, I feel really blessed that you're here with us. I checked out your website kind of extensively, I think even before you signed up for this workshop and like you guys are up to some pretty interesting things and you're doing quite a good job as well about, about the way you talk about it. So um, I'm, thanks for coming. I hope we kind of meet all your needs and stuff, but I'm very intrigued by what you guys are up to as well. Thanks. Adrina, Andrina, you want to go? Yeah, yeah. Um, hello, I'm Andreina. I don't know if you remember me because we met a long time ago, like more than 20 years ago, one afternoon in Vancouver, um, many years ago with my, uh, Manuel Hernandez, nice. Manny Hernandez. Yeah. But anyway, um, I'm an artist. I am a, um, an artist that paints with real paint and, 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 and caustic paint, uh, wax and, and pigments. And I'm also a designer, and I've been using Adobe's tools for many years, which I consider AI too. And 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 uh, the new ones, the apps, I've been using in the iPad for a while too. Um, it is just kind of confusing all the options that for me that that they are, and I wanna like find a way to collaborate with. Um, as an artist with AI and do my work um, more in, in tune, I, I guess, mm -hmm. more connected mm -hmm. with the community and, and faster too. It's um, um, I I have been afraid for for a few months of what is the future of my own work, mm -hmm. and I I mean the word afraid, <laughs> um, but um, there was an, an an article you sent few weeks ago that I read and, and it made me feel like I, I, I really need to learn more and, 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 and be part of this. So awesome. Thank you for cool. coming. I can't quite see everybody on the screen. So why don't you hop up next if you would like to introduce yourself? Um, I can. Uh, I, it's, uh, it's not a good camera day for me, uh, no I'm all under the weather, all so, good. but I will pipe up. Um, my name is Lisa Bishop. I'm the senior account director at everything podcast, and I'm here to sort of represent the company. Um, our CEO is in studio today, so she, um, can't sort of be present. Um, but I think I'm, uh, sort of most intrigued, uh, as we see, I'm uh, sorry, we're a podcast uh, production media agency. So uh, there's a lot of integrations with AI in the different platforms that we use from a production perspective, from a, um, like a studio recording session perspective. So um, I think I'm just overall intrigued to hear more about the space, just how it can benefit us and how we can utilize it and access it um, to you know, be more efficient. 
I think from a time perspective, from a creative perspective, all that kind of stuff. So it's more of an embracing opportunity. Yeah. I mean, podcasting is in such an interesting position to take advantage of these tools in, in so many ways, because like, I mean, it's, it's the ultimate in multimedia, it's audio plus video plus images plus text and scripts. And, you know, it's, um, are you guys using Descript? We're not use that from a like a, a hosting perspective. We're on Riverside is um, we use from a, a session perspective, mm -hmm. and we just recently are starting to learn about a lot more of those backend AI tools mm -hmm. that I think will definitely benefit us, even our creatives as well. From um, you know just being able to create digital content like <laughs> you know audiograms and promotional trailers to show notes and things like that that. Um, won't take away from the creative process of a podcast, like a custom branded podcast. Yeah. But again, just has those sort of time savers when you're, you know, using skilled talent and what they don't necessarily have to expel their creative talent on, if that makes any sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I find some of those tools the most, the most interesting. So um, Riverside is a podcasting studio platform and it's, it's pretty awesome. I use it as well. And then Descript is a, uh, audio and video AI editing tool. The coolest okay. thing about Descript, uh, and the reason everyone should check it out, I, I feel so powerful. You, the, one of the main reasons I'm so stoked about this stuff is because I literally feel it amplify my personal creativity and power, my ability to output and do things that I couldn't do before. So I, didn't have the time, focus, or energy to edit audio and video. It's like for every minute of video that you see, you know, highly produced, there's usually like 10 hours of editing or something like that behind the scenes. And it can be very, very challenging, especially if you want to do high-end audio as well. So this tool, Descript, completely changed my life. Um, when you import a video or an audio file into it, it pops up the text file. It, it transcribes it immediately and pops up a text file side by side with the um, audio video editing window. And I can show you guys this in a minute, but, um, it allows you to make edits to the text file that change the audio and video in real time. So you can, and it, it programmatically can take out filler words like, like, and, um, and, uh, and whatever. So it'll scan your whole thing, identify the ums and the uhs, ask you what you want to replace them with like room tone or blank space. Um, and then you can literally like and if you've done the part where you record your voice into it using something like Eleven Labs or um, Descript's overdub tool, you can not just delete sentences that you said but don't want included and it will update the audio and video, but then you can add sentences back in by typing. So you can say AI trends and tools for marketers and creatives, and it will say it back in your voice and add it back into the podcast via text. It's, it's quite incredible. So I would have had to have an audio editor and a video editor and multiple rounds of back and forth. And I can now do those things really quite easily. Plus the whole pod squeeze thing with show notes and timestamps and mm -hmm. chapter headings and stuff. I mean, those, those tools are just incredible. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, great. Who up next? Yeah, I don't know if you'll get an answer from Jen because I know she's in the studio. She's there, but she's no problem. Probably not Let me just scan my list and make sure that I don't skip anybody. Emily, Jessica, Bailey said she doesn't want to speak. I think that's all of us. Cool. Okay. So, um, my AI journey began like just over a year ago. Somebody showed me mid journey and they said, Hey, you got to check this out. And I went there and, um, mid journey takes place on discord. A lot of these visual tools started out on discord. And when I arrived on discord, it was utter chaos. There was like a thousand streams of, you know, different people generating images. And I felt like they were speaking secret code and the, which they were actually, you know, the way that you prompt mid journey via text looks a lot in many cases like code. You type forward slash imagine, and then you type your prompt, and then you put some modifiers on the end, and, and it was overwhelming. And I had experienced a hacking incident about a year previously, and so I didn't want to put myself out there. I didn't want to jump on this Discord with 10,000 people on it and just start iterating my ideas in public in what seemed like a community of people that already knew what they were doing. So I started my own Discord server that day and I installed the Mid Journey bot on it. And I started inviting a few of my 
geek friends there. And I think that's why so many people here today were like, yo, I know Chris from 15 or 20 years ago is because this has brought me back in touch with so many people from all the different epochs of my technological life. And, and that's been one of the things that's meant the most to me is it's like brought all these hyper creative, technical, interested people back into this communication space where we've been learning together. And so in some ways, I feel like I got really lucky. That was a fluke. It wasn't strategic. I didn't know that if I created that Discord server that day and installed the MidJourney bot on it and invited a few of my friends in, that I'd end up creating what now is like a 550 person creative community of artists and professionals that are there um, sharing not just our own projects with each other, but it's incredible, really. You know, it's like people are sharing best practices, tips and tricks, free codes to use tools that, you know, have only existed for a few days and all sorts of stuff. And so that's become a, a really important place for me. And, and that put me back in touch with the world and it got me getting invited to do keynotes and kind of like workshops and talks like this and stuff. And so um, that's kind of how I got here. And um, I, I am a little bit worried about AI coming for our, our jobs, you know, like um, when I was growing up, you know, we always knew AI was coming. They talked about the robot workers and AI, you know, and people always talked about it coming for the driver's jobs and the factory workers. And, you know, maybe that we replace waiters and waitresses and you'd order via a laptop or something. And, but, um, you know, turns out you still need drivers and factory workers and all that kind of stuff to run a business. But whether or not you need creatives, is becoming more and more of a, um, of a, of a question, you know, I mean, I think a, a lot of um, there's been a contraction already. I think we saw it with writers first, you know, I think a lot of writers are um, facing some serious challenges and, and, um, and so that's one, one area that we can, we can talk about um, about the writing stuff, but um I think that if we don't adapt and evolve and develop some strategies inside of our studios that I think we will see um, a contraction. Put it this way, guys. Last week, there is last month, there's a, um, an online retailer here in Vancouver called Article, mm -hmm. and they have a 12-person photography studio inside of their organization, like a 100-person company, and 10 of them are um, in the photography studio. And last month they laid off their whole staff and replaced them with CGI designers and 3D designers, essentially shutting down which was what was a physical photography studio. And that's the first one I've heard of. Um, but as I've gotten back on the photography wagon, I was asking myself, you know, what are the types of photography that AI and you know or advances in emerging technology can't replace? And the list is pretty short that I came up with. It's like pet photography and family photos and a few things like that. Portraits maybe sometimes of loved ones or, but like a lot of event photography and, and a lot of these other things. I mean, the whole process is, is completely changing. And I, I think that, um, you know, without uh, adapting that I think a lot of people have the, the risk of being left behind. And I'm um, very empathetic. You know, this is the Second big tech revolution I feel like I've lived through that's in, in, induced a bunch of identity crises and the people all around me. Um, you know, uh, when kind of YouTube and blogging and the first generation of social media came out, there was a lot of filmmakers who hadn't made films in three or four years. And during the time uh, uh, that they hadn't made films, the whole way you make and release and promote a film had changed completely. And so I was kept coming into you know contact with these people who considered their film self filmmakers, yet none of the skills they had were the skills you were required to make a film in today's day and age or whatever. And so I feel like we're very much in the same place. There's a lot of designers and writers, marketers and communicators out there who are making salaries and uh, having these identities and careers as this, you know, profession, but the, uh, the, the components that make up that profession are, are changing completely. And so um, I think that we're trying to, to pick up those new, new skills and stuff, but I think it is a time where um, I, think, I think it's nip, nipping at our heels for sure. Um, what are you guys seeing in terms of that kind of stuff? What's the pinch for you with the careers uh, uh, as it comes to wondering if AI is going to replace us? Peter, what are you seeing? 
that might be a good segue actually i have a few slides and uh i'm curious yeah i have actually some data and polling on this that was done in the u.s at least uh, which might be relevant yeah. cool. um and i can just jump into some kind of fundamentals a bit here to level set before we go into some best practices later and stuff can i can i add something yes please um, go for it yeah i'm seeing the rate of change accelerate so like the so for example even projects like doing trends work research or even i've been working on a gpt uh, llm with um somebody on how to do scenarios right to put in the data so i think it's a question of the work that you mentioned, like when the YouTube and podcasting stuff and kind of acclimating yourself, I think it's the, the type of work you do and it's adjusting to the tools that you can do to go faster. So I think the rate of change that you will be able to do things is shifting. I think that's the biggest thing I'm seeing a lot and that people aren't getting their jobs eliminated if there's more work, it allows for the same amount of people to do more, but you have to be trained and you have to know how to do it. And I have this theory, so I'll let I'll shut up. But I think that all the tech companies overhired they for COVID. They didn't know what they were doing. I I I avoided one at McKinsey, um, a layoff, but they've got rid of all these people because they're trying to retool themselves. And I think once the people who train themselves, like we're doing here, like you're retraining in the next year. When the bull market comes back and you know web three transitions into a new world like it, it's people they're going to hire people like that that are that are equipped because their their rate of change is 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 adjusting so i don't know what you guys all well I, I mean i definitely think that you're right that um that and this is also part of the reason why i encourage the kind of community-based learning that i keep talking about is i don't okay. think this is going to be the last tech revolution we live through in our careers i see that accelerating pace of change and that's why i like hold up these two concepts around like curiosity and flexibility as kind of like my overarching uh guiding principles you know i i want to cultivate a, a resilience within my career and I, I do that by being curious and scratching at the surface of all these things and experimenting and trying to be ultimately flexible best i can um things seems like things are going to keep going fast that's for sure jessica i see your hand up go for it um from a writing for a copywriting perspective i'm seeing a lot more people using chat gpt and things to do stuff they would have normally, you know, gotten me to do, but I can tell that it's been done by chat GPT. And maybe the issue is like, they're asking me to edit that too now, <laughs> but the issue right. is that they just haven't caught up to like learning how to prompt properly and then take what it spits out and like sort of make it into something mm -hmm. that's actually useful. Like right now, everything kind of looks the same and you can kind of tell when someone has used it because it uses a lot of weird adjectives and like a lot of repeat phrasing and stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's a only a matter of time until people actually like start getting to do better prompts and then they won't need me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll see. I, I do like the, I mean, that is an interesting one about you doing editing. You offering a new service of editing other people's uh, AI generated copy and stuff like that. That That's pretty funny. Um, you mentioned in the chat and we can talk about this today, um, but I'll even just mention it right now. You know, one of my writing, so a lot of times when people aren't quite ready to engage in the whole AI thing yet, they're like, yo, I tried to get it to write something for me and it came out and it was bullshit. And I'm like, um, okay. Yeah, that, that is what happens. You're right. However, I think you might be conceiving of it a little bit differently than I conceive of it. And so this is where I start to get into the AI mindset thing is I'm like, it's not a question and answer machine necessarily where you're like, what's the right answer. And it tells you back the right answer. It's more of like a, literally a collaborative partner, like a companion where I'm like asking it questions, asking it to generate stuff for me the reading what comes back, iterating on that. And, and, and Peter will talk about some of that when it comes to the prompt engineering stuff. But as you know, cause I think you mentioned it somewhere. One of my big tricks for all this is I fed GPT right at the beginning, every piece of writing I could find. So I went around and started assembling or transcribing YouTube videos and podcasts and blog posts and even um, long form uh, email communication and stuff like that. I exported my WhatsApp messages as a text file and I fed all of those into chat GPT and asked it to, based on the things that I had written over the last 10 years, develop me a writing style guide. 
And so I have this notion document that is my writing style guide. Then I took those same documents in a different situation and I had it develop me a worldview and perspectives document, which is freaking scary because uh, I challenge you to articulate your values and worldview and perspective and then uh, point AI at everything you've ever written, spoke about or said in the world and see how well those two things match up. Um, I felt like I learned a lot about how to articulate my own worldview and perspective when I had it generate this document. Were you, were you putting that into like a public chat GPT thing? Like I, I kind of worry about that too, because I'm like, if I put all my personal writing into a chat GPT, can someone then just take that and write in my style? <laughs> like, is that a concern? There's a lot of blurry lines here, I feel like when it comes to this stuff. And so um, the first thing I guess we're talking about is like training data. And that's like, you know, when they, you know, they write the piece of software, you know, the, and then they, then they point it at a big set of data that it learns on or whatever, you know, and, and that's a lot of what we're hearing controversy about, right? Like New York times is like, yeah, you trained yourself on my data, which is one thing. And they've got concerns about that, but they're like, you're also returning results that look a lot like my actual data. You said you trained yourself on, and it looks a lot like plagiarism too. And so, um, that is a different scenario than the one I think you just described to me where you're like, I want to feed some of my writing into it, but I don't want that then to be like necessarily like owned or have other people like write in my style or something like that. So um, we can figure this out together, but I think in the case that you said you are safe, I don't think that if you are sitting there inside of a, a cloud window or inside, you know, there's a whole bunch of different text AIs and we'll talk about some of those today, but no matter what they are, if you're inputting things into it, they're not exactly private, but they're not exactly public either. They're, you don't need to worry about another human coming across that information and stealing it. However, it may be a part of the collective consciousness of some sort um, by putting it in, in there or something. But I think that the direct risk to you is pretty low. In fact, I think that the risk of choosing to avoid interacting with those types of things because of our concerns, that might be a bigger risk. I, I, I do believe that like avoiding interacting with some of these tools and technologies or, or developing that mindset, avoiding doing that because of concerns or fears or not a lack of depth of my own understanding is probably a bigger risk to me than putting my images in there and asking it to help me develop a visual style or something like that. Oh, my hands up. Um, where are we going? Oh, so where I was going was um, I take the style guide and I take the worldview and perspectives document. And every time I'm having uh, AI generate new content for me, I start with those things. So I say, you're a writer. I say, I need to generate um, some social media posts. Uh, I say, here's the press release I wanna use to generate the social media posts from. In my style, from my style guide and in my worldview and perspective from my perspectives document, generate these social media posts for me or whatever. And so I found in that way, I've been able to bring it very, very, very close to my own voice. Um, I also love excluding phrases. I wanted you guys to throw into the chat if you feel like it, uh, phrases that you, that are like, uh, like you're like, oh, GPT wrote that. Like every time I see the word, okay, we're gonna go on a deep dive. I'm like, oh man, that's like full on AI stuff right there. Anytime I see emojis in titles, strong bulleted lists where each one has an emoji in the front. Um, I don't know, I, I, there's a whole bunch of cues that I see coming up over and over again. And when I find those, I try to put those into my custom instructions as words to exclude. Well, if no one else has anything, I'm gonna let Peter go there. Great, happy to, yeah. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of other questions and comments. So invite you to, you know, interrupt at any point. And let's just start with, let's see if I can screen share this. Should be able to. Oh, do you mind uh, making me a co-host, Chris, so I'm able to do that? 
or just uh, enable participant screen sharing. If you click on my image on the screen, those three little dots. You're a host. Perfect. Great. I'll try that again. Okay. Perfect. Cool. So yeah, again, the goal of this section is really to provide a bit of an overview and to make sure we're using some common language and also just look at, you know, some of the trajectory that we've already experienced over the last year or so, right? 2023 in many ways was the breakout year for generative AI specifically. And did these headlines look familiar when you lose your job to AI and tech like ChatGPT? ChatGPT took their jobs. Now they walk dogs. Of course, that was a writer. Yeah, which is definitely to your point, Chris, right? I mean, part of the disruption that we find ourselves in here due to this new automation, right? White collar workers suddenly are, you know, facing the same types of pressures that blue collar workers have faced due to automation over the last 20 years, right? So this is certainly a, a big transition we're going through in the labor market and in the tech industry, it's going to impact every type of industry as uh, things continue here, but it doesn't mean that we're all going to be out of work. I think Steve brought up a great point that, you know, there also will be some serious upsides. The amount of productivity that an individual worker organization has will evolve and rapidly, you know, lead to GDP and productivity growth like in mass. And I think that, you know, we're not exactly sure how it's going to shake out. No one totally does, whether it results in, you know, continued short-term job losses here and then a reshuffling, right, as uh, these new skills and roles get reorganized and reintegrated. Uh, it's, it's anyone's guess. But, you know, to Chris's point earlier, I think in terms of my personal outlook and what I try to instill in my students is, listen, you need to be up to date with this. I'm glad that all of you are here and are investing in, you know, learning all of this because it is critical, right? If if you don't, you are likely to, you know, be disrupted unless you're on sort of the, the bleeding edge, so to speak, right? So, you know, headlines like this, I think are sensationalists, right? To a degree, there is a lot of uh, churn and in media in particular, I think news is one of the most highly disrupted industries they have had a ton of layoffs. That is sort of my background. I think that permeates this culture of sort of paranoia and fear within uh, the headlines that we read, right? There's um, the reality that major media companies are cutting, you know, entire staff. Sports Illustrated lost its entire staff this last week. LA Times laid off 100 workers this past week, right? And so, you know, there are real short-term impacts here, and it's unclear you know, what the future holds for media, right? That said, I do think that, you know, some of these tools here, these are a few of probably familiar brands and, you know, algorithms uh, that are coming to the fore will be ultimately, you know, ways in which people can accomplish more, you know, faster, better, perhaps. There's obviously a need for education, for, you know, human review. There are are certain things that at least in the near future here for the coming few years, you know, are likely not to be replaced by AI. And hmm. I'm curious, you know, I think we got a bit of a sense from some of the comments and questions earlier, but if you could just type into the chat, you know, how are you feeling today? How are you feeling right now <laughs> at this point in the conversation together? Are you more excited? Are you more concerned? Are you about 50-50 today regarding kind of the development of AI tech? And you can just type in excited, concerned, equally. Yeah, or one, two, three, perfect. Yep, both. Yep, so we're seeing a pretty good mix here. Yeah. And for me, it kind of depends on the time of day, right? It's hard to know how this is all going to, to shake out. I'm glad to see yeah, that that folks are having multiple perspectives on this. I think in the long term, I know we have David, a futurist here, you know, things definitely will get figured out and it will be a net, you know, gain here for humanity. I'm confident in that, right? The near term is going to be a lot of disruption and a lot of churn. And we 
are experiencing, you know, more tight cycles of disruptive technological innovation. That is going to be part of the fabric of the labor market here for creatives or any other position. Um, here's how our answers kind of match up with a couple different studies that were conducted by the Pew Research Center here in the U.S. And, you know, they have pretty representative samples. This was in 2021. So, you know, almost half fell into the equally concerned and excited camp. And then after that, the leader was more concerned. Um, and you can see that, you know, a lot of people had some specific issues in mind here, right? The big one that we already have been talking about at the top of most concerned, right, is loss of human jobs, right? Surveillance and privacy and security issues, right, are also near the top of the list, um, lack of human connection and quality, right? Losing out on the humanity and humanness in this, uh, you know, increasingly AI-driven world is is cited as a common concern. And I, I want to compare that to the same study, which was redone towards the end of last year. So after, you know, ChatGPT was sort of let out and unleashed <laughs> into the world, right? It was... Uh, a bit of a messy, unplanned uh, takeover, right? They had one of the fastest paths to 100 million users in history of any tech platform. But you'll see that more people are more concerned now, <laughs> now that we've seen what's happening. And this is something to really think about. A lot of people, if we look at yeah the graph here on the right side, and how things have shifted over the last few years of this survey, right? People are getting more skeptical. They're getting more worried in many ways. And that is because as people learn more and see some of the promise, right? There's a lot of, yeah, thoughts that start to race in terms of what does this mean for me? Um, another question for you all, I think we heard from most of you, but have you used ChatGPT? Um, I'm curious, yeah. I find some of my classes a pretty big mix. Yeah, good. A ton. Yes, no. What the heck is that? Probably not too many people in the third camp now. Yeah. I'm also curious APT what apps. other um, text uh, AIs people have used. If you want to drop that in the chat too. Yeah, feel free, feel free to drop those in there. I see, yeah, people are building custom GPTs as well. That's great. One of the tools I'm going to show you guys today is called Poe. And the reason I like Poe is like, I don't know, most of us look like we're old enough to remember the dawn of instant messaging. And we had MSN Messenger and AIM and ICQ. And then this thing called Trillium came around and it united all the messengers into one messenger. So you can message all your friends on the different platforms using Trillium. I remember that. So yeah, <laughs> now we got Poe. So Poe allows us to prompt a whole bunch of different AIs from one interface. And I use it. It's a great way to start to wrap your head around what different LLMs are better at different tasks. And so, mm -hmm. you know, um, people have been finding Bard quite verbose and ChatGPT good for certain things, whereas Anthropics Claude is, I find the best for just creative writing and, and generating uh, writing that I can actually use publicly and stuff. And so we'll show you Poe today, but um, I love at the outset starting to tinker with different tools. So if you got any other AIs you like for writing, drop those in the chat too. Yeah, please do. I see, yeah, most people here have, have used ChatGPT, many extensively. Um, so I won't belabor this point here. This was a poll, you know, conducted last year where basically only a quarter of, you know, adults in the US who'd heard of it had used it, right? And so it's quickly becoming more adopted, right? But one of the things in this data that's interesting to think about is, you know, the jobs and tasks that are more likely to be, or at least more likely to be perceived as going to be disrupted, right? So software engineers, graphic designers, journalists, um, teachers, lawyers, right? These are traditionally fields, right, where there's a lot of humans um, doing this task. So this includes us, right, firmly, uh, pretty much everyone in this room to a degree at a different point, I, I would imagine, this virtual Zoom room at least. Um, 
Yeah, seeing AI in the Adobe Creative Suite has been amazing too. Here's some more recent data from Deloitte. This was published this year within the last few weeks, actually. Among business leaders, right, people are trending more towards excitement, right? And this would be a sample size of roughly almost 3,000 business leaders that are largely Deloitte clients, right? So you're thinking kind of upper, maybe C-suites, like thinking more probably about the bottom line and more strategically for their business interests, maybe not about the individual worker concerns, but in terms of, you know, profitability, productivity, things like this, right? There is a lot of excitement and a lot of expectation for transformation in the near future, right? We're talking, you know, one to three year timeline is the, the biggest polling answer regarding when this dramatic generative AI propelled transformation will happen, right? The immediate it's happening right now to us answer was 14% within one year, 17. And then the next result, which is the most popular is uh, pretty much nearly the rest of those polled. So roughly 60 plus percent um, are estimating that this sort of large scale industry and business transformation structured around these generative AI tools will happen in the next several years, right? So I'd say I feel all of those things except anger. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I, I ain't you know, mad at it, but I'm confused by it. Sometimes I'm definitely overwhelmed by it lots. And, you know, despite it's like general positive to my life, you know, it's definitely induced a lot of like changes inside me about how I think about my work and my relationship to my to the world and stuff. So yeah, it's been, I definitely feel a lot of those emotions. You and me both. Yeah. I go through the cycles of sort of uh, grief. Yeah. It, it really is in some ways, right. A lot of people are still clinging to denial and, you know, I think you're right. A lot of people who haven't really given a lot of time and attention to learning them in particular, think they're, they're garbage. It's all hype. Um, and, you know, I think they're living really in, in a bit of that denial phase. But the, re the reality is things are shifting, right? These are even reflected in some of the headlines we've seen. These were headlines from earlier last year. A lot of people were talking about, you know, should we be using these tools, right? Is it even ethical to use them? And now it's, it's really more focused on how best should we use them? Who benefits from using them most? And all these different use cases here. And these are a few of the ways in which this disruption is, is unfolding right now, right? And we already are seeing media impacted across all these different mediums, already seeing all of these things here on the left side, considerations being really battled out in real time, you know, litigation. I don't expect policy to really come around because here in the US, at least, we haven't even been able to regulate social media companies successfully. So I'm I'm not optimistic about that. I do think that, you know, in terms of litigation, we will see a lot more things coming that will impact the way that we all work as, as creatives and those in media here. Um, we're going to talk more about this, but I just want to also talk about, okay, what are a few of the terms that we should all get on the same page with here really quick? What is AI, right? Simulates human cognitive functions. Okay, fairly broad. That could be anything from a self-driving car, you know, to chat GPT. Um, what we're really more focused on here is, is something called machine learning, right? Which is a further subset of AI involving training computers to recognize patterns and make predictions, right? And this is how many of these generative AI algorithms are yeah, formed and structured here, specifically using neural networks, which again is a subset of machine learning. So we're getting more and more specific as we zoom in here to think about how are these systems working and structured. And, and this is really helpful because this is going to inform us some best practices even to really figure out how we interact with these different tools. So neural networks are composed of these interconnected units. You can think of them as neurons or brain cells, right? That process information kind of collectively. And this is, you know, how 
GPT-4 Turbo, for example, or Claude 2 are structured. They are trained on massive data sets. Uh, if you were able to, you know, basically put them into the same relative scale, each of these nodes as a neural network and cellular structure in the human brain, it would be roughly a squirrel-sized brain, right? If you were able to kind of translate that on a scale size-wise to a physical brain. Um, but just like we don't exactly understand how the brain works in making decisions and pattern recognition and generating you know, behaviors, it's the same when it comes to a lot of these algorithms, right? It is uh, in some ways using them as less science, more art, right? We are learning uh, best practices as we go here, but it is a bit of a black box, right? We do not know how we get from an input that we prompt ChatGPT or Dolly or you know any of these other algorithms or services to the output directly. There's very few ways to trace that successfully that are not you know incredibly labor intensive. In in some ways, it's not even possible for the top engineers working on these projects and academic researchers who specialize in neural networks to actually unravel this. So th this is, you know, a security concern to a degree, right? It is also a bit of a conundrum. Um, it is a mystery box to a large degree, and, and it's because of this neural network structure. So what is generative AI, right? This is what we're here to discuss today more, right? This is sort of the creative branch. It's a type of, you know, this neural network technology that is used for taking all of this, you know, training data and algorithms and spitting it out into content, right? And that is everything that we've heard in the chat here from, you know, yeah, we have, for example, I'm looking at Adobe products and some of their generative fill for Photoshop to uh, some of the voice cloning, 11 lab stuff. All of this is, is using um, generative AI tech. So just kind of setting the table here with some basic vocabulary. Um, I want to be sensitive to time here as well. So I have a couple things that I'll wrap with, which are more of trends. And I'm really curious, actually, David, for your feedback on these after, these are short-term projections, right? I am not a futurist. I am sort of a media nut, right? And so these are probably in the next 12 to 18 months ahead is what the timeline I'm thinking and trying to prepare my clients and my students for. So these are the things that we're already seeing, right? And that many of you are probably noticing the streamlined content creation. So generative AI for cost-effective automated multimedia content generation, revolutionizing the production and distribution of tech, right? So this is going to impact every part of the media, this multi-modality the ability to input text and get a voice clone, right? Uh, or an image or a video or vice versa across different formats is going to be increasingly powerful and common as these models evolve and these services evolve in the near future here. Personalized media and advertising is also going to continue to become more powerful, being able to use all of that data as We've traipsed around the internet on our Google browsers, for example, or even using Gmail. All of that big data that has been collected over the past decades or two in our digital journeys navigating is going to be suddenly able to you know, use this training data essentially to serve us more products and more personalized experiences right, in ways that we might not entirely be comfortable with, um, but maybe highly effective uh, depending on you know, the route that this tech takes. Deep fakes, right? We're already seeing these. Many of you are probably familiar with the fake photo of Pope Francis in a puffer jacket that went viral last year. Uh, this was kind of a pretty innocuous example of this tech, right? We're also unfortunately dealing with, you know, things like, uh, you know, revenge porn that is AI generated deep fake and, you know, lots of dis and misinformation. Um, not just in sort of visuals, but, you know, video, audio, all of these different mediums, and multimodality, they're advancing so quickly without any sort of real checks and balances and system at the moment 
that's comprehensive to be able to discern what is, you know, human generated and what isn't. And that line is getting increasingly blurred as well. So uh, in terms of what sort of hand we have in all of this, same with, you know, this series of photos of Trump allegedly being arrested and going to jail. Um, Hasn't happened yet. We'll see what happens this year, guys. It's going to be a wild ride, but we will no doubt see a lot more of these uh, deep fakes going out. And with over a billion people across democracies in the world going to the polls this year, we will see some really, really unexpected influences here. And part of it is there's now plausible deniability among any politician that whatever they did that was perceived negatively, corruption scandal, maybe their voices on tape saying, yeah, I'll take that bribe from you, you know, Mr. Oilman or whatever, uh, is now feasible as being deep faked and being written off. This is an example from just in the last couple of weeks, right, of celebrities dealing with, with the same thing. This is Taylor Swift, who was not Taylor Swift and was actually a knockoff and on Facebook, Taylor Swift's AI avatar in video form was hawking Le Creuset cookware. Again, don't have a problem with the cookware. Big fan of Le Creuset, but this was not authorized. This, you know, was a, a total scam and a lot of Swifties got conned. So these are the things that are going to be happening more and more. Already we've seen in the US here, Tom Hanks and other, you know, major celebrities and household names be their image and likeness and voice and you know video visage being replicated without their permission um for a variety of scams and deep fakes so this is going to be continuing to happen and it will trickle down into our daily lives to scammers will get the keys to all these tools at the same time as everyone else and have more of an incentive to be really savvy with them before people understand we have a system to decipher you know, real, quote unquote, from false. But this is some of the things that can happen. One last slide here before I turn it back to Chris. It's just double checking where we are here. And this cannot be understated as the end of search, right? What does that mean? Um, in a world where, you know, ChatGPT is connected with Bing and there's sort of this fusion of chatbots with data sets and services like Google search, we are going to see a, a great disruption in search engine optimization and in sort of the fundamental models that underpin the ad-based internet that we operate in, right? And this will mean we have a lot of- It's like the understatement of the century, bro. Yeah. So it's, like, you know, already so much of the top Google results are AI generated. And, and then like, so you've already seen Google throw in the towel too, because if you Google stuff now, like the first five results are sponsored posts. Like it went from like, I feel like they're just trying to wring every last drop of value out of Google right before it does collapse. Probably like the search part. I don't think. Yeah. They're cannibalizing their own business model, right? They are desperate here. This is a major threat to Google. And it is a major opportunity for Microsoft and Bing, but there's going to be, you know, a big fight ahead here and how this all plays out. It's going to be really interesting to see, right? The publishers are terrified. The initial sort of test well, that, even of this generative yeah. AI search. Sorry, just let me finish this and then I'll hand it over. Um, the initial drop in traffic with this version one test of generative AI customized sort of personalized results in Google search was 70 to 90% drop in traffic. It's crazy. That is destroying every single news and media and content business on the internet today. And that is yeah. happening. Well, that's the direction things are going. Business too, because that's like the marketing side of things, you know? It's like, how do you get your content found out there? Do you even blog? Yep. Anymore, you know, like How does SEO work? Is it GEO generative, you know, yeah, optimized search or something? Hey, Steve, I see your uh, hand up. Yeah, I, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, yeah, like David, like I've been a practicing futurist for, you know, 20 years. And for me, I think the thing that uh, when I see with the my day job too, doing futures work, but also I work mm -hmm. with a lot of blockchain. So for me, right the thing that I've been doing this year is kind of bringing together AI and blockchain because yep. the blockchain creates the trust layer. 
Like, Absolutely. where is the content coming from? Where is the information coming from? Like, where, you know, the sources you're getting from. And I think one of the things that I see, and I'm curious to get David's perspective too, is like, I really want to hear this. Me is too. that when you think of hype cycles, right? It was two years ago, it was metaverse, 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 right? I work with a lot of innovation groups and like their experiment money was in the Web3 world, right? Yeah. That shifted to AI, right? It's a question of now, with the rate of change, what is going to be our, oh, this sucks moment. Like with Meta, when they laid off everybody and they spent a billion dollars and the metaverse sucks, it's really, yeah. it's just- it's No not, one has it, legs, literally. Right, it doesn't have legs. Right, no one has yeah. legs, exactly. How do you see the person <laughs> in front of you? Right, yeah, exactly. So I think we're going to have something like that in the next 12 to 18 months that's mm -hmm. going to shake the system of AI. I think something's going to really get people through it and it's going to, go through to what you talked about. It's going to go through this, like, okay, the, the people that it's like buy when everyone's selling, sell when everyone's buying, right? It's like, that's the time you really need to take advantage and get into this because eventually it's going to be coming to the productive levels that people need, right? Yeah. But it's a question of different industries and the growth. So I think that the time now, like what we're doing is learning it, but at the same time, like, is this different? I don't think so. I've been through four cycles, right? Four shifts, you know, networks to internet, internet yeah. to social, social to AI. It's like, there, like you said, there'll be more, but you know, you got to have perspective. So and David, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your take on this. Well, well, well you thank you time. real quickly. Um, Peter, all of the stuff you've, you, you have up in the screen now and you put up, it's happening right now. So it's not That's like, right. is it going to happen? It's happening right now. Um, That's right. The, the, it, when I talk about it, you know, I try to simplify things because people, you know, first of all, I, 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 I'm swimming upstream on this, in the sense that I think that, um, you know, back when AlphaGo happened is when I really got, oh, okay, so, so um, AI is going to be significant. It's the next big thing. It finally is right after decades of all talk, no action. So mm -hmm. I, I did a deep dive into it, and I realized that that you know i ask anybody here in this room raise your hand if you like something that's artificial better than something that's real so i think that one of the whole things about ai is that it's it's a misnomer in the sense that you look up the word intelligence and in five dictionaries i looked it up and in no dictionary was the word human used in other words whales are intelligent dolphins are intelligent so it's not that it's 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 um you know, uh, mm. artificial, it's that it's technological, right? So it's technological mm. intelligence. So the fact that on sub subliminal sublinguistic basis, we're using a name for it that is not what we like. We don't like anything that's artificial, like artificial flowers, artificial whatever, right? So, so I think that has already set the stage to a negative. The second mm. thing I'll say is that when I give talks about it, I say that after... Um, the fire, fire and the wheel, uh, electricity has shaped how humans live on the planet as much as any other invention. And that uh, the next invention equal to electricity is technological intelligence, that it's going to shape how we humans live on the planet. The third thing is very simply, whenever there's a massive new technology, it disrupts the current reality. Yep. And this whole superficial thing that annoys the hell out of me about, am I going to lose my job? Well, <laughs> you know, the Luddites were people that burned the cotton gin because they thought it would take away jobs. Right. And what it did was it created more jobs, the Industrial Revolution, than any other thing in history, right? So it's just that the artisans were no longer employed. Everyone else was. So, you know, this is inevitable. And the last thing I guess I should say is technology is morally neutral. You know, it's not good or bad. It's how we right. use it. So so the the real only danger in here is is non coordination at a global level of its usage. I it, thought you it, claimed to be a McLuhan follower. Would he say that technology is morally neutral or does would he say that it, every media has its bias that the medium oh, is the freaking message it's not that what it says that comes across it, it, it medium um, media is the environment in which we live it's not right or wrong good or bad it just is 
So so he's never said that it's bad or that it's good. He just says that it 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 reshapes our perception of reality. You know, the the example it's obvious, you know, I'm obviously an aging baby boomer and so I grew up with television, right? And television in the 50s was called the boob tube and it's going to dumb us down, right? And the American IQ has gone up every single decade since. Why? Because it gave us exposure to the world from our not just our hometown or our neighborhood. So so everything, the, you know, and, and the true thing is, what are we scared of? Are we scared that AI is going to cause a war in the Middle East? It's going to cause massive wealth in, inequality? I mean, it's like we've just created this as the technological other, right? Computers are bad, right? TV is bad. So humans always create the otherness things, which is our historical problem. And we're doing it to this technology. So anybody who's scared of it, you know, it's just like people say, oh, I want to keep my privacy. Well, it's gone. Right. So get over it. I think that the question about like, you know, do, do we, you know, do we prefer real things or artificial things? I mean, it's kind of a, it's an interesting one, but it assumes all of the things being equal. Like, of course we prefer authentic real things over artificial things, but there's lots of cases where artificial things might be the only things that are available to us. You know um, I'd rather have artificial flowers in my room than no flowers at all or something like that. Yeah, no, I, I use the example that the only time I've, I ever liked artificial was when I used to ski and there was no snow, but they created artificial snow so I could ski, right? Yeah, in the absence of the real thing, we will accept artificial. So the problem here is, are we going to accept artificial rather than the real human? And, you know, that that's a false uh, uh, conversation. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I think it's technological intelligence i mean i don't see how it's not it's not artificial right. it's real peter thanks for um dropping Thank some you. knowledge for us and leading us through your presentation david thanks for adding that stuff i uh please don't feel um you know unless somebody complains man i love you keep talking with this is very edifying and i really do think I, I, that I, I, I want to get all your wisdom. That's I know, I know, man, but we are coming into a relationship with one another and getting to know one another. We will continue to part uh, wisdom upon each other throughout, but I am ready to rip into some tools. In, Please I just do, yeah. Pause here for a minute. Um, see if anyone has any questions or feedback kind of before we move forward. No, that's great. Um, David, I would also add the other biggest technology change in the 20th century was air conditioning. He's muted, but I, I unmuted him. Let's rock it. it, it it's, yeah. it's 20th century, right? 20th century, I mean, yeah. What, what, what we really are, in the yeah. largest way, is that we're leaving the defined reality that we all live in, which is 20th century reality, and we're moving into 21st century reality. And this is a fundamental bridge to the 21st century, what we're talking about today. Okay. Um, so anyone else got anything they want to say? All right, since Peter mentioned deep fakes, I'm gonna get in on this one right here. I think this would be a great place to start. This is a deep fake that I created recently. Um, and I use three tools, um, ChatGPT to write the scripts and do the translations, uh, 11 labs, uh, voice cloning technology, which is something I'll show you right after we watch the video. And hey, Jen, virtual avatar video creator. Uh, it's incredible. So uh, has anyone else messed with these tools yet? Um, you need to share your screen, Chris. Yeah, I'm about to. Oh, okay. Sorry. Just the ones I had mentioned. I was uh, wondering. Anyone else cloned their voice in 11 Labs yet? No. What's it called again? It's 11 Labs. 11 Labs. Let me I have to take the hosting back. Let's see here. Peter. Oh, here. You yeah, make I need host? to make. Yes, yeah. you have passed the official torch. Uh, Right. Here, let me pass it back to you. And then in the future, we can make one another uh, co hosts. So right. here we go. Hey, I see a reclaim option. Nice. Here we go. Oh, nice. You beat me to it right on. Podcast where we delve.
Hey everyone, welcome back to the Motley Krug podcast, where we delve into the avant-garde crossroads of art, technology, and life's most intriguing questions. Psst, that's not me. I'm your host, Chris Krug, your tech artist, quasi-sage, and for today, your cyberpunk linguistic maestro. Now, I have something straight out of sci-fi to share with y'all today. Buckle up, because we're about to break down some serious language barriers and invite the world into our ever-evolving digital tribe. Trust me, this is some next-level shit. I've been up to me eyeballs in the enigmatic world of generative AI lately, and the possibilities have really got my wheels turning. I've always wondered what it would sound like to hear myself speaking flawless Japanese, Swahili, or even Russian. Well, thanks to sweet new tech from Eleven Labs, HeyGen, and Anthropic, I won't have to wonder anymore. I've built a multilingual deepfake experience, but wait, don't tune out. This isn't a dystopian tale. It's a snapshot of the magnificent present. I've put together a series of videos that break down not just technical boundaries, but also cultural and linguistic ones. The goal is simple, to invite everyone, whether you're from California like me, or from as far away as Okayama or Kampala, into our inclusive global digital community. Now, before we get into the audio snippets from these videos, let me set the record straight. Ethics first. This video, nor the ones to follow, are intended to be deceptive deepfakes. Each video has been carefully crafted with utmost respect for the cultures and traditions. The goal is not to mislead, but to bridge gaps, to foster a respectful exchange of ideas, and to ignite connections across this tiny planet of ours. So, without further ado, here's a glimpse of my AI clone greeting you beautiful souls in seven different languages. I hope you're sitting down and have your headphones in. You're about to hear me like you've never heard me before. Welcome to Chris Krug's Global Digital Tribe, Bridging Worlds Through Language and Creative Technology. زبان و فناوری خلاقیتی پل میں زند کون ینگ لائی داو کریس کرگ دے کون چیو شو زیبو لوو تونگ گو یو یان ہے چونگ یی کے جی لین جی اے شی جی دو برو پوز خالو بات وہ گلوبال نو اے چی فرو وو اے پلیمیا کریسا کرگا سو اے دنیا یا میرے شیر اس یازک ایت فورچس کے تکنولوگی کریس کرگ کے عالمی ڈیجیٹل قبیلہ میں خوش آمدی زبان اور تخلیقی ٹکنالوجی کی ذریعے دنیاوں کو ملاتی ہیں क्रिस क्रुप की ग्लोबल डिजिटल ट्राइब में आपका स्वागत है भाषा और क्रिएटिव टेक्नोलॉजी के माध्यम से दुनिया जोड़ रहे हैं देयर यू हैव इट आई टोल्ड यू दिस वाज गोइंग टू बी अ फकिंग ट्रिप आई वुड एब्सोल्युटली लव टू हियर व्हाट यू थिंक सो दैट वाज माय फर्स्ट एवर डीप फेक एंड फैबुलस आई लव वाज दिस द सेम टूल दैट यू दे यूज फॉर मिले स्पीच एट द वर्ल्ड इकोनॉमिक फोरम आई बिलीव सो They turned his Argentinian into English, so him speaking in his voice. Oh, I believe. Hey, Jen, right? Yeah, we're going to go through it. You guys want to build one? Awesome. Um, anyone else have any thoughts or comments before we dive in here? Just want to learn the tools that you used. Yeah, man. Okay, so this is called Hey Jen, and this is where I tie it all together and build the finished product for a thing like that. And so what you end up doing is you record via your webcam yourself, literally just talking to your computer, and it gives you some uh, parameters about how to do it. It's like don't move your hands above your chest, don't look to the left and right, pause for two seconds between each sentence, and just say and don't repeat the same words over and over again. Get, I think those are the main guidelines. So, um, and they give you um, like, as you can see here, like uh, these ones that say free revision, free revision, free revision, then fine tune. When you sign up for the account and pay the 60 bucks or something like that, um, you get three that you can record and keep recording and then the fine tune one. And I haven't noticed a big difference between the fine tune 
and the uh, the free ones actually. So uh, I might not even pay for the upgrade on the fine tune one if you're just experimenting with it. Um, so I recorded these three different clips. This one of me in the studio, and then the next to the love sign and over here next to the red sculptures, and um, and it does its AI thing. And then what I get back is the ability to make um, like new videos. Um, and so go here to create video. So this is the text box where you can put all the stuff and, or you can already record a voice and, and bring that in. So let me just um, say, um, welcome. Yeah. So it's generating there in the background, the audio clip. In the meantime, I'm gonna show you guys something else. Oops. Sorry, I'm just having a little Zoom trouble here, trying to get into a different window. Welcome to class. Let's give this AI thing a test. Okay, so that was the audio that was just generated from my little text prompts there. And then if I click submit up here at the top, it's gonna go ahead and work on a video there for me in the background. It's gonna happen pretty quick. So maybe we'll even just stay here for now. I should show you guys this thing that I made with this. Uh... Pardon me one sec. I think this is right here. Great. Um, this is a tool that I've mentioned a couple times here. It's called Eleven Labs, and it is how I do voice cloning. Um, I've experimented with it a bunch here, both on things that I had already recorded that existed out there on the internet, and then also I essentially read it David Attenborough Planet Earth scripts, and um, I got back this guy. So this is how you work with it. I have a few different options here from like. First of all, there's like a thousand standard off the shelf voices you can work with. These are some of the variables that you get to choose from, clarity and similarity, stability and style. Let's check this out. I think that, hey there, let's go ahead and try audio cloning of our voices. So this is uh, speech to speech, which is one of the newer ones that just came out. <laughs> hey there, let's go ahead and try audio cloning of our voices. So text to speech. Is where you type stuff, choose the voice. I chose Valley Girl. Again. Yeah. Hey there, let's go. It should have generated a new one for me. Hold on. Hey there, let's try cloning of our voices. So that's more what the normal one would sound like. And then I can just switch to like my voice. Hey there, let's try Oops. cloning of our voices. Pardon me. Hey there, let's try cloning of our voices. Which is different than... Yo, let's try to clone these voices. Oops, sorry. I think I just lost my.
<clears throat> check one, two, let's go ahead and clone our voice in the speech to speech setting. Ahem. Check one, two. Let's go ahead and clone our voice in the speech to speech setting. So this one's kind of amazing. If you can imagine, you could um, go speech to speech with anybody's audio. This is where you could bring in like Princess Diana's voice or Martin Luther King's voice. You know, you could and then you could talk in your own voice and switch back and forth between the two. And so then I've integrated that back over here. Let me just stop sharing again and then restart. Where's my, I think it's this one. I'm trying to get back into um, page in just a second. Disappointed. What's that? What do you guys see right now? Welcome to class. Let's give this AI thing a test. So that's the video that it created. Welcome to class. Let's give this AI thing a test. In my voice. And so it's using two integrated tools. It's, I recorded the voice in 11 labs and I pointed hey Jen at it and it's going over there to grab it. Does anyone have questions about this deep fake stuff? Is my audio on? I'm I'm guessing yeah, if you have you. your environment set up and you're like on the road, like you can use those environments and essentially continue to create content and podcasts. You know, well, absolutely. But you could also like have uh, daily headlines fed into GPT to write things in accordance with your style guide and worldview document and feed that into 11 labs to make audio files from, and then publish that as a podcast in your voice without any human intervention. That's an interesting workflow. I'd be curious to understand where the manual, like, can you, can, are they integrated and can you do, or is it just, you take one, you do that, you have the step workflow of the, to that, right? So. Yeah. I mean, it, you'd be building your own custom workflow based on what you need, but like, I have a friend who's podcasting right now and he's got like five different podcast hosts voice that he's created that they have different personas that he's created in GPT essentially. So they're feeding text out in five different voices into five actual audio voices. And then he's feeding those different bits into a podcast that gets published via RSS feed essentially automatically. And so um, it's, it would be specific to your case, but it's like pretty, pretty easy to tie a lot of those tools together, I would say. So you take it from the, the, when you get to the later in the class, like the style, like when you say a guide, are you putting them in as prompts or is it a document it, it, it has in its library that it learns? It, that's what I'm curious to like, how do you, uh, train, do it, do you train it? And it's yeah. permanent or do you, yeah. So I have, sorry. I have a couple different ways that I do it. Um, one sec here. I want to show you one thing. Yeah. I don't want to take away from the. Oh, no. Everyone's um, got the same questions. I'm sure. Right. So okay. <laughs> I'm in GPT, right? You guys are still seeing my screen. No, just you. Just okay. a, sorry. The crew. How about now? Just black, a little tiny little blinking it's not, it's not icon checking. about the screen. Okay. Oops. So I think it's your video. Maybe it's your video output. I don't know. Okay. One sec. Thank you. You see chat GPT? Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm sorry. Just my face, huh? While you're juggling that, I just uh, want to flag a product called Mind Studio. And disclaimer, I basically teach their customer 
what they call developer certification program, but it allows you to create very sophisticated multi-step workflows that integrate all these different tools. And so it's model agnostic. You can basically plug in uh, for each individual step, you know, a GPT-4 for something that requires more sort of analysis. You could plug in at a different automation step, something like Llama 2 for more coding intensive tasks. And we're already, you know, they're serving more enterprise level customers than OpenAI is like substantially already. So if uh, you're interested in learning more, happy to tell you about it. We actually have a free training this Saturday that I'm running. So this uh, has some cool applications. Um, yeah. This reminds me of Zap. It's like Zapier. Like you're, you're it triggering. Is. It's a mix. That? Yeah. Picture Zapier, but you can upload your own proprietary data sources. Cool. You can have it query your own internal database. You can have it uh, plug and play with any other third party, you know, API call. Uh, it's very sophisticated if you want it to be. But also, if you just want to build basically a custom GPT on steroids and make sure it draws for specific steps from your data sets, let's say, you know, your, you know, personal brand vision statement or what have you, your communications, guidelines, previous versions of your work, you can do that too, uh, very powerfully, very easily, but it has uh, a lot of cool stuff. But again, I'm biased. Like I reached out to them because my students were playing with this and I introduced them to it and they loved it. And then they said, why don't you teach our customers how to do this? They're, they're a growing startup, but th I think they're doing some pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. Happy to, um, here's yeah. the, here's the workshop. Uh, on Saturday, I'll just drop it. If you are interested, yeah, I have a, a quick, I think it's a Google form to capture, but here we go. Yeah, it's called AI Development Essentials. Sorry for this random aside and plug here, but it it is a really compelling thing because you can also, it has a dolly, you know, basically widget, right? It's called a custom function, but you can essentially have it do image generation, right? You can have it do voice cloning and all this um and so it's it's pretty sweet yeah i'll be there for that on saturday i want to mess with it with you w would love to invite all of you honestly yeah just uh fill out this quick um air table form if you are coming so i can add you to the google event um or just drop your you know what even easier would just be like drop your email in the chat if you want and i'll invite you right now um so you can at least see it but here is the, the official form too. Did my screen share work this time? Yes, it hey, is working. Cool. Um, eventually I just wanted to show you. So I'm in chat GPT now for those of you who haven't messed with it. And one thing I wanted to show you guys was custom instructions. And so this is like a beginner way to get things to start being output in your own voice. And so um, here's my custom instructions and I change them all the time. But um, what do you want GPT to know about you? And you can turn this on and off and you can have professional and personal um, bios or company ones, you know, one for each of your client at clients, I would even suggest that you develop. And how would you like me to respond back? And so you can say here, give me short answers with citations or longer answers, you know, in, in different perspectives and stuff. Um, and we can talk more about, uh, useful different best practices amongst custom instructions but i would always set these up they are definitely kind of like a um more intermediate that most people don't even mess with their custom instructions and so they're just getting general generic output out of chat gpt and this gives you the ability to customize the input and output quite a bit the next level up from that is writing what's called your own custom gpt and so this is inside ChatGPT. And when I say writing, I don't mean like writing code. Every single person here can do this. And if you've got long-term clients or your own personal projects, I might even suggest that you do one of these for each of those things. And so what I've done here is I've trained a custom ChatGPT instance on just my projects and business. So my Motley Crew Media Company, these future-proof creative training sessions that I'm doing, and the Fatal Festival, this other festival that I'm working on. And so I might just say, uh, you know, write me 
some social media posts for this week. And it's already going to know about my business, but not yours. And so likely it's going to start me off with um, some stuff related to my, my things. So fo focused on art and innovation, community voices, VR and future tech. And I might say, um, that's great, but this week focused on generative AI for image makers, specifically um, mid journey and diary. Make the posts about that. Um, did you train it with links to your existing social? Tool? Yeah, I'll, I'll take you under the hood there in one second. I, I trained it with um, links to my existing social, but also like outputs of my account, my social media calendar and stuff like that. Uh, you guys can't see right now because I'm just doing one thing behind the scenes, but I popped into my notion where I'm grabbing that worldview and perspectives document. I'm going to cut and paste it into my clipboard and I'll bring it back in one sec. So I think I'm back with you. Oops. So you're still seeing GPT? Correct. Great. So what I want to do is I have in my clipboard here, you'll see this document that says, I believe in human connection and emotions. I believe in a future where technology and humanity advance each other. So it developed all of these, I believes, based on things I had written and podcasts I had done and video blogs I had written. So I keep this in my notion, which is like a personal knowledge base or wiki, and I can cut and paste it in. Use anecdotes and quotes to illustrate perspective. Post questions to encourage discussion. So now I'm gonna have it do the whole thing again. Write those social posts about image generating AIs. But make sure it's from my perspective. As outlined in my document. So it's already getting it really close. Social media posts em embracing open source and creative and tech, which I would say very much defines the type of stuff that I put out there. So I just want to grab this little piece right here. Let's say we liked this one a lot. Um, translate this for me into Android. We're heading back to 11 laps with our now translated Mandarin. Hi there, and welcome to Mind Studio. In this video, we'll be walking you through everything you need to get started building your own AI powered app using Mind Studio. Someone needs to mute themselves. Okay, one sec. So we had it write some social posts in my voice. Translate them to Mandarin. Let's see what happens. Sometimes this doesn't get it right the first time, but let's just give her a shot. And then we're gonna um, download the audio file that it's created and we'll pop over into, hey, Jen. Let it finish up doing what it's doing there. And then I'll, um, here's the little download for it. So now we got an MP3 on our desktop. Gonna go over to Hey Jen. Make this one a little bit different just so you can see 
the difference. We'll go portrait mode for phones. And we're just gonna drop that Chinese in there and see what it says. I wanted to show you guys one other thing too before we go away from this. It might take a minute to think about that there. Does anyone have any questions or comments? All right, we'll get back to that then in a minute. So we're just going to submit that so it goes and creates the video and then we'll double back for that in a second. So, I mean, it seems kind of simple, but I spent like a couple, few months figuring that out, how to get from in my head, out of my mouth, into text, translate the text, clone the audio, integrate the audio into the video. And then now I can publish YouTube videos. And I do all the time um, that I don't record any audio or video for. It's all just me pressing text-based keystrokes and doing writing. It's pretty pretty powerful tool I found. Um, maybe next, while we're waiting for that to generate, I could take you guys into Discord and we can do some image generation. How's that sound? That'd be great. Cool. Can I, uh, before we do that, can I ask if, if you could Please. look, do you know Brett King's uh, podcast, The Futurist? No. So Brett's um, a, lot, a lot of early banking work. He's uh, married to a woman named Miss Metaverse, but what I've, I've used their podcast page. If you look at, I'm fascinated with how they do their guests, like how they create them. And then they put them in the background. It's all, you know, it's all mid journey. Like I'm just fascinated with how they're doing it. So if you get a chance and break, like take a look and, you know, you know, yeah. an example. We, maybe we should make one of those um, here today. We'll see. We'll see where this goes, but um yeah, like one of the things I've been trying to figure out is if I take my photo and I wanted to do something and use it for AI, right? Or a guest, right? And then put them into the background or the things or describe the things that's their environment so I can create the the image of that, like the environment, but with yeah. a real photo of somebody. That's just like, is it two parts? Is like, I'm curious how that I think works. We can do th I think we can do that here today. I'm pretty sure cool. I think we can pull that off. Um, all right. So, seeing this, are you seeing my Discord window now? But maybe, yes, awesome. Discord is like Slack, except it developed in the video game and hacker communities. And a lot of the Web3 Bitcoin type stuff that was happening back in the day happened here as well. And what that meant was all everyone was already hanging out here when generative AI started to take place. So a lot of the generative AI communities and early access to the tools and stuff happens through Discord. So on this, so on the left here, there's just different channels. This one with the red fro, that's my channel. And here's the different, uh, you know, uh, channels on my channel, for lack of a better word. Um, hold on, just a sec, let me close that. Um, and one of the channels I have on my discord is this mid journey channel over here. And this is the one I got told you, I lucked out and started creating very early on. And if I scroll back through this, you, what we're looking at is all the people on my server generating, generating images in a public place here on my server or whatever. And so like this one walking my dog bot spaced Western crystal grids style of psychedelic artwork, absurd doodle, diverse characters, aspect ratio 16.9, no man people. No man people is an exclusion. It's like, we don't wanna see human men in these, uh, in these things. And aspect ratio is obviously a modifier. This link right here is a reference image. So we were feeding it this as a reference image. And um, we'll we'll talk through all of that stuff, but um, that gives you a little overview of what's going on here. So I, I have a question: Is Mid Journey its own app, or or is it part of Discord? I'm not clear on that. Yeah, Mid Journey is a company, and the company has a 
AI tool and the AI tool is the same name as the company. They're both called mid journey. And so mid journey is this AI, but the way you interact with the AI is through, through discord. So the way I would think of it as software that we call a bot and that bot has been installed on my discord, but it, it is a separate AI, a separate product or software. Chris, what are the little <clears throat> UI, U2, U3, like buttons or whatever they are underneath each of your the, they mean upsize and variant, variant, and we're going to do that right now. Um, so uh, you start with just a blank chat, win chat window right down there, and then you type the imagine command, and that brings this up for prompt. And so this is where we can start to prompt something. And um, does anyone want to just shout something out? Space shipper. So it's running some stuff right now. And I tend to not wait for it to finish because I'm trying to iterate and get concepts out, you know? And so when I'll be like um, a, a photo representing spaceship Earth. So what's going on now is the AI is trying to understand what I mean when I say the two words together, spaceship Earth. It's like, what the heck is this guy talking about? And so it's out there trying to figure it out and it's generating in the background these coming into focus images um, based on it, it, it trying to best respond to, um, to, to what I prompted it with. Spaceship Earth is a Buckminster Fuller concept. Buckminster Fuller was you know, famous for making geodesic domes. And so a lot of the stuff that I'm coming up with here is a geodesic domes. Now, my no man people exclusion is set up from yesterday. And so I wanna modify that so I can start to open up the range of things that it's given him here for a sec. So let me show you some other stuff. So settings is something you'll find yourself medicine with all the time. And so we can see a few things here in the settings. I have my current suffix set to include every time I'm prompting to add those things at the end, aspect ratio 16.9 and no man people. Also, I'm using version 5.2 of mid journey, which is not the most current one. And I'm gonna change that to six right now. I'm also gonna change the stylized to very high. I think I'm gonna leave everything else as it is. However, what I really came here to do was to change this thing right here. You can see at first, watch, watch it change here for a second. Um, I just changed it to style low and I'll change it back to the version 5.2. So it appends each prompt with those variables. I just did it, show, changed it back to show you. Now I'm gonna copy these into my clipboard and I'm gonna, I just happen to know that this is the command, but you can look up all the commands here as well on your own, but it's called prefer suffix. So you can see all these commands start to come up on my screen for me to choose from, and I'm choosing prefer suffix. And guys, don't worry. It's not as geeky as it seems right now on the surface. You don't mess with all this stuff most of the time. I'm just bringing you in through the front door. So under prefer suffix, I'm just gonna drop, I'm gonna paste off my clipboard, those things that were up in the settings area from before, because what I wanna change is this no man people. And I can just delete that. And I'm also just gonna make the aspect ratio one to one for now, um, just so we can observe the change. So we increase the style, change the aspect ratio, and are using the most recent model. And uh, look, my buddy Kevin's there. That's so funny. My, that guy who was just typing impending thunderstorm there, I think he's in the next room waiting for me to finish this class. He's probably like, hey, are you done? I see you're on Discord. Um, so I think that the results are gonna be quite different. We're gonna do the same prompt of what was Spaceship Earth. Let's say we loved this one here. This, this is from before, I'm letting it generate its thing. But let's just say we loved this one, which we don't, but let's just say we did. Um, U is to upsize it, which be, and it's gonna generate it down at the bottom of the screen. It, this blue line just popped up to say that it was done. 
but then I'm also going to run some variants. And it allows you to change the prompt slightly between this variation and the next one, but you don't have to. If you're like, I just like that image, I just want to see some variations on it, you don't got to change the prompt at all. But I'm going to say um, Vancouver summertime. So it will probably add the first things I prompted it with, Spaceship Earth, to Vancouver summertime. So this, this one we're looking at is not the Vancouver summertime one. This is after the change to version six, highly styled and ass effect ratio 1.1. And we got rid of the no man people as well. And you can see just at a glance, I feel like that the difference in quality between the previous version of mid journey and the latest version of mid journey, plus my, my being less restrictive with the no man people and the more high stylized variants, the, the quality improved a lot. I feel like that looks like a Taj Mahal or something. That's interesting. I think what's really occurring to me is, you know, as a design futurist, I mean, my whole thing is about speculative uh, artifacts of the future, right? Design fiction, like Julian Bleeker, like, so when you have a scenario, you can take the scenario and create the world and through this and actually envision that for the client. So like you could actually create those, instead of just the text of the scenario, you can articulate the scenario through you know, what would used to take, this is again, the rate of change. What used to, if somebody would create this for a presentation would take days. Dude, this Wikipedia thing I'm about to show you, I don't think it would have been possible with like less than a hundred thousand dollar budget and like five concept artists on staff, like essentially like, wow. like movie quality concept artists on staff. Like just to reiterate your point, like you've got it. You've got it. Like you, the, the barriers to iterating your ideas are lower or, 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 or not even, there as they've ever been before. Like you can literally flesh all this stuff out on your own without, without having to invite other artists in one man band styles and really take your idea yeah. pretty far down the road. And I mean, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. time when everything is possible at a level of near perfection, it really begs the question of like, what are you gonna use your precious time to do? It's like right. anything can be done now in any language at a level of any quality, you know, in, in the, it's like all of a sudden the concept and like why you choose to do something becomes more important than it's ever been because it's not just about having technical proficiency or high quality stuff. It's like, what, well, what are you really trying to say here? What are you really trying to do with this thing? I feel like it becomes more important than, than the thing itself in a lot of ways. No, but, you're right on. I think the two words that come to my mind is I've been learning this the last, and I remember when I worked in Autodesk, on generative AI and watching that do 50,000 versions of a bike part to come up with all the designs. And this was a few years ago. I knew it would be a game changer, mm -hmm. but it's like the, 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 the keywords and you think about, you guys talked about Google search and Google kind of dying because Google is like this dumb search, right? This it's about two words, imagination and articulation. Cause what you're doing there is the imagination of Sasquatch, right? And the ability to articulate the key that it requires more work on your part. But once you have that, you can go beyond any, what most people are willing to do. And that's, I think that's it. I think that's yeah. the big. Absolutely. So I wanted to show you guys one thing here. Um, we decided we liked this image and we upscaled it, which became this image. So that's a new, now a higher resolution version of that one. But then we also decided we liked it and we wanted to make some variants of it. And I typed in Vancouver or summertime or whatever. And so then we get these guys here which are pretty clearly uh, both the geodesic dome spaceship earth stuff, but then remixed through a Vancouver future thing, right? And now we can do this infinity times essentially, you know, we can, um, we can set, first of all, let's just upscale it. Cause that's going to give us some more options. I, but, I think it's interesting. Your prompt is like, it's bringing like Epcot center. I see a lot of Epcot Center in Florida. Well, Epcot is a geodesic dome invented by Buckminster Fuller, and Buckminster Fuller wrote Starship Spaceship Earth, and so that's why mm, Epcot Center. Got it. Because I was thinking, why wouldn't it be a Dyson Sphere? If it's a Spaceship Earth, why wouldn't it be like a Dyson, right? It's well, a Dyson Sphere is a particular kind of geodesic sphere that uh, harnesses the energy of a star. Of the sun. It's yeah. the whole, yeah, the whole system, the spaceship. Yeah, no, but it's David, interesting. You're why... muted, but we obviously want your take here. 
Yeah, please. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, the problem I have with a company, with a nonprofit called This Spaceship Earth is it, it, it lots of times people try it and they get Disneyland, right? Or Disney World, sorry. Um, but it, it, so, it, but, but Fuller, I mean, Fuller came up with the geodesic dome. Right. Um, and what what you're what you've picked up is the Disney Disneyfication of the geodesic dome, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, unless you're specific, Steve, you're going to get that image on space right. Earth. Okay, and this goes to the articulation point, right? Being able to say spaceship right. Earth with Dyson's or as Dyson sphere or something in space, sorry, like not or on Earth, right? In you know, it. Right. Your point, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, I like this. Imagine Spaceship Earth not on Earth. Floating through space. I'll just let that do its thing for a second. Um, okay, I want to uh, just kind of keep hitting you guys with some different weird functions of this thing so that you can start to wrap your head around some of the stuff that's going on. You guys re recognize this image from Pulp Fiction? Oh, yeah. Check this out. Describe this image from Pulp Fiction. Oops, hold on just a second. Well, we for our spaceship Earth, we got uh, actual Earth floating through space there. But I thought I think this is pretty cool. So this is AI trying to figure out what this image is. Pulp Fiction wallpapers, movie wallpaper, woman in black with lipstick and cigarette laying on a bed in the style of an iconic movie cultural reference. So then I always love this part after I, I'm like, imagine all of those. So we've taken an image, we've asked it to describe it in text, and now we're just taking that text and feeding it back into the AI to see what it comes up with. I did this on a photo shoot of me recently, and it it, it was so cool. I'm going to show you guys that. Check this out. Um, I'm off in another window again, a set grabbing a couple of things. Wow. Interesting that it brought the gun in because of the Pulp Fiction reference or whatever. So here's another way of doing that same thing that's kind of interesting. This one is this picture this guy took of me. Copy link, describe. Um, I want to, let's. Let's see what it has to say. A man wears a sweater and large beard while posing in an art studio, grungy patchwork, black work, smile core. <laughs> Pretty funny. All right. And I hit the generator button. And now I want to show you this other thing that I, I didn't like invent it or anything like that, but it, a lot of this stuff is like recipes. Like you don't invent a dish, but every time you make the dish, the, everyone interprets the recipe is going to be a little bit different or whatever. Right. So reverse engineer the image by having to describe it and it's popping out all these bearded guys in art studios and let's just say i like this guy here mr number two now check this out i have another little bot installed on my mid journey here called insight face swap bot and i preloaded it with uh, my face which is pretty easy to do. So I'm just going to go down here to in swapper. <laughs> the 
So I think, oh wait, you guys can't see that, can you? Oh yeah, you can. I think this is pretty amazing. So I started with the image of me laughing. I had it describe it and ended up with pictures of some bearded guy in an art studio. And then I swapped my face back on to the finished product, which is about as deepy fakey as you can get, you know, we could probably do you guys too. Well, that, that reminds because I could take the image from the future. You could take an image from like the website on the futurist and, and put it in here to tell me, cause it'll give me the style of the grad because it's all it, that's real i didn't even realize it could reverse engineer that yeah i can reverse engineer anything but then it can put you back on top of the now like i just think that's incredible wow <laughs> my totally different my it's photographer different. was really pissed off i saw something the other day that was this but with barbies like you put a photo of yourself in and it puts your face into a you know a barbie version of yourself it's, but it's exactly what you're just doing so then I wanted to show you guys this other thing here. Only works on generated images. Let me find one. I'm really surprised it's still in Discord. I'm surprised they haven't been given a billion dollars. And Dude, they made $200 million profit last quarter or something like that. They just launched here. I have to stop sharing again for one second. And then... You almost need like a technician to run your Zoom for you if you're trying to be the talker. You do. Well, next time I'll have one. <laughs> Share that screen. They just launched some new functionality on their website and it's pretty sweet. You get to see what I've been up to lately. I'll show you here. So this, they didn't have when we first got started. And this is my personal image generation profile. Those are the ones I, I just made. <laughs> it's so interesting. So, and then this is like other stuff I was doing for future proof creatives lately. And you can sort by just the grids or just the ones you chose to upscale along the way, um, you know, different image sizes and stuff. But their new website is pretty, pretty awesome. You can also get free hours on mid journey by going here to this rate images option. And by you use the one key or the two key, you just, all you do is say what images you like better. And they, and you get free mid journey hours uh, for doing this and you're training the AIs on what humans prefer or whatever. So I, I do that from time to time, just to kind of get a feel for, for what's going on there. But this is the non discord side of mid journey. And soon, as you can see here, this is why I brought you here. Imagine is coming soon to the web. It will only be on Discord for like another week, probably something like that. And it will come to the web. I'm going to go back, take you back to Discord. Here where I used to work, they banned Discord. Couldn't even use it. Couldn't get to it. I guess I'm sort of not surprised. I mean, people will ban anything if you let them, especially if you work in the corporate environment. Yep. I mean it's probably perceived as full of security risks, even though I don't think that's exactly true, but the security risks are the other people you're going to meet there. No, they're just grumpy. <laughs> they don't want people. On it. Um, okay. I'm trying to show a couple of the other functions here. I wanted to show the zoom out. Hold on one second. The newest version of Mid Journey version six that you saw me switch to doesn't have all the exact functions of version 5.2. So I'm just going to switch back to that for a second. Let's see what it does with our Pulp Fiction thing in this version. I mean, every time I hear an interesting phrase or get an idea that won't leave my head or something like that, I come here and I explore that idea and I have a lot of fun with it. That's what I was talking about solar punk earlier, about regenerative agriculture. We can explore some of those too in just a sec. You know, 
um, a makerspace, solar punk makerspace, a liminal. This is, I found a few things that I like. Everyone, as they get to know these tools, will find things they like. I love using the word liminal. It, it gives things a really interesting otherworldly quality. And a liminal means like the space between two things, the moments between when you're waking up and falling asleep or moments of transition. And, and um, so anyway, I found it saying a liminal photo of, what was I saying? A solar punk maker space. And then another one that I like is, um, I say like 2050s film still, or you can say anything. You can say 1800s film still. Let's try that. It'll be more different. Film still. And what was I saying? A solar punk makerspace. All right, let's see. Weird that it generated this guy with the dragon, but we're gonna play with him for a second. So you can see this time around, I got more functions because we switched back to an older version. I wanna do this um, zoom out thing. So, you know, ever since I was the beginning of me being a photographer, I would, oh, I missed so many image sales because people were like, oh, this is amazing, but I need a whole bunch more white space around the head and some stuff over here on the side for the marketing copy to go and the headline and, you know, the QR code. So this, this photo is great. I'd love to buy it, but can you give me a zoomed out version? It's like, no, man, the, it, it is what it is, you know, like, but I can't, I can't go back in time and, and zoom you back out, you know, but one of the coolest new things about these is you, you can zoom out now and it will literally like create all the stuff that's on the outside of the image. And I should show you this cool zoom out video I made. Hold on one sec. Channel. Bro, it's not just the deep fakes that you showed me. videos just one sec guys thanks for your patience okay one more second Share screen. Oops. So this is a cool collaborative art hey, project we did on my Mid Journey server. Um, so we, I started a prompt. Then somebody else came in and zoomed out from my image and changed the prompt. And then a third person came in and zoomed out from the image and changed the prompt again. And we ended up with 50 still images. Then in reverse order, we started with the most zoomed out one and we made a video zooming into the first image. And so this is like a time-lapse collaborative artwork of a group of people on my server experimenting with mid journey when this new Chris zoom Krug, function came out. Welcome to an artistic journey where creativity, collaboration and technology converge. Join me as we explore exquisite corpse with MJ zoom out. We began with an image and from there the adventure unfolded. Through a process of upscaling and transformation, we embarked on a path of artistic discovery. The concept is simple yet profound. Zoom out. Each zoom is not just a visual expansion. It's a creative evolution. Themes emerge, ideas blossom. From the ethereal beauty of a cyber love garden to the intricate complexity of a biopunk microcosm, our shared canvas became a fusion of diverse imagination. The voice and shit's a little Shapes, earnest, but it's like six months old, so, dance so together. You know, whatever. Whether it was arabesque geometric infusion or abstract forms, each contribution- But just, so again, like- A special thanks to- 
you know, we started with an image like this. Then somebody came in and changed the prompt and zoomed out and we get this. Then somebody come, else comes in and zooms out to here. Keep zooming. It was a pretty, pretty fun little experiment. And like that, that was like the most collaborative, interactive AI art project I've ever been involved with. It was pretty sweet. I mean, it was a bunch of people over Discord creating um, images and videos together. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I think I may have exhausted my mid-journey hours um, while we've been doing this demo, which is kind of funny. I have a question about, you know, once you get an image you like, can you actually fine tune that image? Like in that last shot you showed, you, you liked everything about it, but you wanted the door on the left to be blue instead of orange. Can you start like actually working with a specific image rather than iterating? Yes. So, very region. And I'm going to use the little lasso tool. When you're ready, describe the image. I am less of an expert with some of this stuff, but it's still going to be fine. <laughs> as as you're um, figuring you know, some things out, would you? Are there any mid journey uh, YouTube channels or other other people that are doing prompts you can kind of see experiments that you recommend? That, that you one like? is whack. It at least subbed out the area, but it didn't sub it in for what we want. So let's just try that again. My favorite. Um, AI YouTuber, the one that I can, the only one I really can keep up with and I watch everything that he publishes is called Matt Wolf. W -O -L -F -E, Who is it? L-F-E, Matt Wolf. Matt Wolf. It's so good. I only have to watch it once a week for half an hour and he inspires me and blows my mind about all the newest tools that week. And awesome. he shows tips and tricks and techniques and a lot of the stuff that I do, I've learned from him and keep tinkering with. Let's try to fix. Oh, they, it, would, it just hadn't finished yet, Susie. I, I, we just hadn't got there yet. We didn't let it. We didn't let it resolve fast enough. Let's go back to my. Bear with me one sec. I'm trying to switch over to the browser again. There we go. Was it called Math Wolf? Matt Wolf. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mid Journey. This will be an easier place to see those pictures. Oops. Are you guys following me in my browser here? Great. So there you go, Susie. It's like, that was the one and we decided we liked it, but we wanted a lion instead. And so, you know, we can continue to iterate on that as well. Female lion, move it to the other side. You know, I could go back and, out, you know, circle that again with the lasso tool and say, um, candle, and then go back to the other candle side and swap the candle for a lion the same way using that lasso tool. Um, yeah, and 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 so that's why I barely ever go into Photoshop because now you can do you can do that in Mid Journey and you can also do the exact same thing in Canva too. And Canva is a tool that I use uh, almost every day. How about some other questions about the stuff you guys are seeing, Leslie? How you doing out there? I guess that's my answer. Maybe I lost her. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, bear with me. I'm going to pop over. Oh, let's go check out the um, hay gen that we were waiting to finish. So that was the one where we fed it my style guide, had it write social media posts about whatever, translated Chinese, 11 labs voiced it, brought the 11 labs voice in the video. And like, it's not about me speaking Chinese on the internet. It's like the possibilities are endless. That could be your CEO or your client or a made up character. Oh, I wanted to make up a character for Steve and see if we could do that as well. I'm going to drop you guys off and head back to Discord again. Isn't there like an option where you just share your whole computer screen? And I don't have to switch it every time. Anyway, Discord. Yeah, you can share your desktop. That's what I was looking for. Let's just grab this guy because we got him. We got you, dude. You and your lion, the moody, moody guy and your lion. I'm not. Anybody, I'm seeing a black screen. We can't see it. We oh, can't okay. see it. It's it's buggy oh. again. Okay, let bear with me one sec. Coming for you. Share screen. This time we'll go into here. Do you got me in a browser window with dude and his lion? All right, cool. Let's go to Hey Jen. Actually, let me make sure I save that first. Okay, we do it like this. Photo avatar, generate talking photo. Where do I get to choose my photo? Maybe we'll do that in a minute. Um, upload, here we go. Was that our was that our guy our guy with his lion there? I can show you one real quick too. Um, Steve, here's one that I made that was like what you're talking about, and then we can do it together here in a second. How about day campers? KK is about to make a video clone Thinji and at that attempt to link link his voice clone Thinji to it. <laughs> so that's Max Headroom plus my friend plus some lady speaking Hindi or whatever, you know, but you can take any image you want and then any voice you want and then make the mouth move that way here. Photo avatar. Oh, we'll get her to talk. That's just who we happen to have here. That's fine. Oh, that didn't work because she's copyrighted. Interesting. Very interesting. I noticed that ChatGPT lately has been um, sometimes giving me results that makes me think that uh, they're being sued by the New York Times or something. It's like, you should go look that up yourself. I don't feel comfortable sharing that information with you here. It's like, oh, you didn't say that a week ago. Something's changed. What do you want this guy to say, Susie? It's got to be inane with that face. <laughs> no one needs to... Um... Oh, you know what? Let's get him to say, hold, hold that thought. Uh, 
Let me see here. Let's go with this guy. And let's go the old speech to speech. Okay, here we go. Hope I don't offend anyone's sensibilities. You never know what I might say when the mic comes on. Hey, young man, you want to come over and watch The Lion King? No, that wasn't creepy. That's weird. Hey. I was trying to summon uh, that lion guy that we all watched at the beginning of the pandemic. What was his name? Joe, Joe the Lion Man or whatever? Oh, my God. Young man, you want to come over and watch The Lion King? <laughs> Okay, hold nice on. John Wayne. Very nice. So creepy. Download that. And then let's pop back over to our lion, dude. Hey, Jen. So, Chris, quick question on Mid Journey while you're doing it. Is, do you go into a newcomer room? Is that what it is? Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, I mean, you can go there and there will be other newcomers there as well. But I just even found that intimidating. You should pop onto my server and hang out in general. I mean, you can do it wherever you want, but if you want to- No, I'm there. I'm, I'm in there now. I mean, I've been on your Discord yeah. forever. Good. Good. So. What's your username? Crazy Irish. Ah, sneaky Pete. <laughs> Pardon me a sec here. I mean, maybe I'm down a rabbit hole at this point. Oops. Oh, I remember why. Here we go. Audio script. Upload lock local audio. I know that these examples are slightly nonsensical, but I actually think I'm giving you all the constituent pieces you need to build all sorts of amazing stuff. Okay, we'll get that guy working. And we'll come back and visit him in a second. Okay, I'm just popping into my notion here where I took some notes earlier. Um, you guys got the mic for a second. I just wanna make sure I'm hitting on the things people wanted to cover. Mid journey prompting. Um, Leslie, if you joined us again, we could take a crack at your communications plan. Oh, are you guys running otter.ai? Is anyone running Otter? Okay. No, I've used, I've my, used it. I used it a lot for One of my research. partners use it. Is it for meeting notes? Yeah. What do you think about that, Leslie? I haven't looked at one of them. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, I'm, so in, the, I'm in the meeting, you know? Here's the, here's the philosophy that I'm bringing to the table. And then we can talk about like the actual tactics, but it's like, those individuals who are most easily able to get thoughts and ideas out of their heads and into the world will benefit the most from AI because you can start to run those things through AI and do stuff with it. So there's a few ways to get stuff out of your head and into an AI deal withable format, right? And the easiest one I found is audio to text transcription. And so I use that two ways every single day in my life. I'm recording this meeting's um, uh, uh, audio and I will transcribe it. And then I can put it into ChatGPT and tell it to build me a curriculum and lesson plan based on the stuff that we taught here today. So that it could even have a more like organized um, start to finish kind of perspective or whatever. So by getting recording audio, transcribing it to text, and include and then pulling the text into GPT, you can start to do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. And I would do that for both yourself and for your meetings. I think that's why your your colleague is doing it. Um, not only can it, um, as soon as you hang up Zooms, if you want it to send meeting notes, summaries, and action items to everybody that was on the call, but also you can start to query it over time. It's like um, take a look at all the meetings that I did this week and make me a to do list for next week. So where, where like, imagine that, imagine that for a second, like every uh, meeting you had this week is recorded. It's all transcribed and you can ask AI to give you a to-do list for next week based solely on the meetings you had this week. And I do this every day. I, um, when I wake up, 
I journal. I talk to my phone for 20 minutes in the audio recorder mode. And then I transcribe it and I apply like a handful of, uh, what do you call it? Like therapists and stuff at it. I have like a nutritionist and a branding person and a supportive girlfriend and a harsh critic and a psychologist all look at my transcript each morning and to just evaluate where my headspace is at and give me ideas and recommendations for my day and make me an agenda. Leslie. So to use your example, uh, I do a lot of media training. So I train people in how to work with media and I have a pretty established curriculum. So, you know, I've got my slide deck, I've got my usual shtick and examples and stories and whatnot. Just give me an idea. I know I'm just putting you on the spot here of how I could use Otter AI or another tool to maybe make that better. Otter, um, okay, so here's, again, I'm gonna totally wing it. So I'm, I'm you and I've got all your documents, you know, that you talked about or whatever. And so I might say something to my phone in the mornings, like, um, I do a lot of media trainings for clients. I've been doing this for like 25 years and I have a really good reputation and I've helped people significantly. I've developed curriculum over the years full of stories and all sorts of stuff. However, it's a little dated in this day and age, and I'm really looking to figure out new things that I can reinvigorate it with in the area of AI. In particular, I'm interested in, and you can start to talk about adjacent areas that you're interested in, or you could talk about the one section that makes the least sense in my curriculum these days is the part where they're doing self-coaching in the mirror, because instead of self-coaching in the mirror, we can now do Skype coaching via AI. So update my curriculum based on uh, me wanting to replace the mirror practice rehearsals with video chat AI rehearsals or something along those lines. That would be one way to do it. Or another thing to do, like you were talking about earlier, and I, this is another one I would do all the time is like, I brought on a new client. They have a website and an annual report, and I'd really like to help them update their communication strategy. I want to integrate AI in doing so. So help me ingest all of their documents in the past, make some sense of it via summaries and outline what you think would be a good idea for new stuff to add to communications plan in the future. And then you get that outline back and you're like, okay, well, this is great, except the first five points are wrong and the second five points are great. Let's focus on the second five points. Let's expand upon those with a particular focus on video for the CEO or something like that. And so I iterate with it in a back and forth way where I'm like, okay, take that chunk, leave that part behind. And now let's work this. And a lot of times if I want to, if my ultimate goal is a communications plan, I don't always be like, yo, output me a communications plan for BC Ferries. I'm like, BC Ferries is a client. They got all this tenure and their voice is this. And this is the type of stuff that I do. And I need to make a communications plan for them. So help me identify a list of questions to ask them, you know, or something like that. And then I might not even ask them those questions, but I might be like, okay, let's assume I ask them these questions and they give me answers. What should I then do with their answers? You know, and it can or, or actually start to say, well, if they answer things this way that they're focused on digital strategy, bring together, you know, this thing to the table or whatever. And so a lot of it's that kind of back and forth. You know, everyone's always talking about AI as a tool, but my thinking about it as a tool evolved pretty quickly into being like a companion. It's like my main work buddy, um, Steve. Yeah. So mine was around, you were, you went through this whole workflow of like two things was kind of summarizing all the meetings. I found with Otter, Otter is great when I do user research and I get interviews with people and I can capture all that and they know it and they take permission of it. Having it join all the Zoom meetings or especially if I'm not there, people hate it because they feel like they're being listened to or being recorded. It's just not cool. So I think it's, I think it's culturally, I think it's, it's, it's going to case, you know, it's different cases of it. So, but I the- I yeah. agree with you, but it doesn't really eliminate the principle. This Zoom recording is just right. as good as an audio, an audio recording. And I would also second your opinion that I try not to send it to meetings I'm not at. It is annoying and it freaks people out. But culturally, we're a changing fast, guys. We're a changing really fast. There's been a bot in this channel the whole time and no one, oh, I guess it dropped off actually. Yeah. No, I but have, I, have, well, I have like a boss that's like, what's that in here for? What is that? You know, he's... He don't care about it. he's it, it's a cult. You're right. It is a it is those of us who are early adopters and figuring it out will will win over 
but it's those who are how we introduce them to it or use it. The second thing is you went through this whole stream of consciousness of journaling, you bring it in. Are you using ChatGPT and adding files of it? Like, are you doing a prompt? Like, I'm trying to figure out the tools in which that kind of happens because I love the fact it can build out to do's or it can give, like, you have these different, like, agents, like, girl, you know, critical girlfriend or, you know, therapist. Like, can you? Well, I want my girlfriend to be supportive, but my harsh critic to be harsh, you know? <laughs> like, well, but like, what is that? Where is that? Is that a bot? Like, where does that come from? Like, that's what I'm trying to understand. Like, the, you have, a, there's probably a lot of steps and you see them in your head. I'm trying to understand the, the little more detail in that because it's I awesome. Understand. Yeah, I understand. Um, so there's a couple ways to do it. I keep a lot of stuff in my notion so that I can cut and paste it in. So yeah. in the case of those journals, what I do, I record and then I transcribe, I save the transcription to a text file. And I go into chat GPT and I attach the text file and I say, from the ver from the perspective of these 10 voices, analyze this text file. Got it. Another way to do it would be as custom instructions, but the real way, the best way to do it state of the art right this second would be to build a custom GPT. Let me just show you that. I built one for us. Uh, I collect uh, vintage sports cards and I have a whole chat and I created an app and it's like, I can train it with data like that. And it's like, so I'm curious on a personal level, how do you make it additive, right? Do you plug it into things to pull that? Or are you adding, like you can add files in the chat GPT, right? When you're doing that, right? And you can train it in the editor, right? Yeah, exactly. This is the GPT builder. Mm -hmm. Let's say KK bot. I write for Chris. <laughs> um, write in my voice and style. Approved. Now, I'm going to just disappear for half a sec. I'm back in my sheet, grabbing my worldview and perspectives thing I was telling you about. And I'm just going to say uh, my URLs are... have done this before it's probably yeah, the, be useful. the script you pasted in do you have like a template of like or is that just somewhere referenced it's like it's just in my notion I, I just built it i mean i can pop over and show you it if that's useful one sec it would help for a sec just to yeah no problem man i'd love to share screen notion style and perspective so are you guys on my Notion looks like Motley Krug Media with a little dragon. Yep. Cool. So I just, well, first of all, this is my brain. <laughs> this is where <laughs> I put everything and AI is integrated into this as well. So anytime you've got a blank page in Notion, you can use AI to start, you know, get from zero to one and get some stuff down. So along the left here, I've got all my projects that I care about and I work on. And this is a companion to all AIs, I feel like, guys. Not only because it has AI built in, but like, what you going to do with all that smart shit you just generated and all those cool images you just built and all those audio files and links and all that stuff? Like, you better have a place to make sense of it all and get back to it. So it's like everything you see before you was one way or another generated sort of with AI. Like, I didn't like come up with the themes for all my workshops for AI and I didn't build all these pages and links, but... I've used AI to create all the documents and pages um, 
all throughout here. So one of the one you asked about, Steve, was uh, the perspectives one, which is right. here. And I've, I got a, a second version of it here that I've been tinkering with, tinkering with, but this is the output of ChatGPT when I spent a couple hours with it, putting in my writings and recordings and getting back out what I think about things. Inclusivity and respect, empowerment through diversity, interdisciplinary approach, art as liberation, view art as a means to free perspective and challenge conventional thinking. So you can see it's gonna be answering things in a very Chris Krug way, not necessarily just some generic, um, you know, GPT voice or whatever. And so I'll, I'm gonna give it this one instead of that other one I gave it. Where was I? I was here. And right below, here it is. Uh, okay, so I copied in that thing you were just looking at there about like truth. Multiple truths can so coexist simultaneously. No, that this helps a lot because you and can do this. With this a is where you upload the files, bro. So in addition to those text-based custom instructions I just gave it, if I wanted to give it a text file here or a hundred PDFs or any body of knowledge. This is how you GPT stuff. Like, I don't want answers from Microsoft. I only want answers from Google, my company or something like that. You know, this is where you can train it only on your data. And you would so, upload Chris, it. love this. I just want to chime in and say that you're able to also have sort of a plug-in using Mind Studio to basically have a workflow to directly integrate with MailChimp to draft an email like directly into your, you know, system or to any other number of dozens of, you know, common softwares that you use. So it's it's basically an extension to make GPTs actually usable in your real workflows. So this is a great starting point is my philosophy. Like GPTs are great for internal use and like I yeah, encourage everyone to test them out. But I think that this is just the tip of the iceberg to how things are moving with this tech. And my philosophy also on GPTs is that the GPT store, for example, is like probably going to be a race to the bottom very quickly here. And, you know, if your GPT is out there publicly floating around, it's also very likely to get hacked and have all of its proprietary data, you know, yeah, accessible to the public. So it's it's really not built for real world sort of enterprise or even like serious professional use cases. Like once you're able to do this, it can definitely help, but you still have to copy and paste and still have to customize and upload everything. Like Mind Studio, you can link a live database starting in the next week or two to be able to have that as like an additional input. So you could essentially automate the entire process of adding to your collective data set for your cards or whatever type could be your journal entries, you know, um, those could automatically get linked in and be constantly updated as a fresh database even for your personal use but you wouldn't have to go and do this every time either so like anyway this is the direction i think things are going in and why i decided to basically throw my hat in with my studio uh because i think it's it's cool and it's model agnostic too so you're not dependent on you know if the open ai goes poof again which is you know we're close to it um you never know with this stuff yeah i think I agree with some of the things that Peter said, and I, I don't necessarily agree with everything. Um, when the, particularly the reference about um, being hacked or whatever. So a lot of people, when they built GPTs, they hadn't really thought about protecting the data that they put into them. And so in many cases, you could talk back and forth to the GPT to get to it to refer to, sorry, to get it to reveal the stuff that it had been trained on and the logic behind it. So people were developing proprietary logic to power these bots and they were feeding them proprietary data, but they weren't protecting the data properly inside the GPT. And so people were literally able to query it to be like, so how do you work? 
what are you trained on? Share me with me the documents and stuff like that. And so that way they were able to hack the GPTs like Peter said, but that was only because people weren't thinking about that from the outset and they weren't building them with um, that, with that in So mind. when you do, sorry, Jessica, let me just ask one, one thing is when you ask it to give you the, the feedback from the different perspectives, right? The critical, like, all, are they document perspectives that you fed into the, the give them the, that gives the profile or they continue, are they additional instructions or how does that, that give you help? Like that's, Sorry if I'm not being clear. No, I think you are. You're saying um, where 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 do the um, therapist profile? Yeah, now they have? yeah because they because they could be like a service you you connected in to kind of give me the oh dude they absolutely could be. I mean that's what most when most people are delivering AI apps right now, yeah. all they're doing is what I just described to you as a recipe and then selling that as an app. So right now. We're on ChatGPT's webpage, typing shit into a browser window. However, you can use their API, it's called, which is just a code, which allows you to, instead of doing it through a browser window, query ChatGPT through a software that you wrote. So the software that I wrote would be those personas, and they could be like an app on my phone. It could be like I journal in the app, and then my 12 personas that I wrote are the software, and via the API, they talk to GPT and return the results. That's pretty much what you're seeing, like Grammarly or, mm -hmm. or like a script or sorry, a grant writer application or um, any of these storybook tools that you're seeing pop up where it's like input your kids' names and a few keywords, and then it's going to output a story with images and audio. Those things are like the, the custom instructions are the software that... GPT is doing the work behind the scenes via an API and uh, you know, the app is returning the results on the phone or whatever, but that, that's pretty much what we're doing here is inventing software. So are you typing it in and then asking it to, to give me perspective based on these people or are you creating different chat GPT apps? No, I like am. I, I haven't made apps out of them yet. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it the exact same way I showed you with my style yeah. app where I'm going into my notion, grabbing my, uh, therapists and dropping them into a request okay yeah all right well i know sorry i didn't mean to sorry jessica you want to oh, this is all good this is why we're here um my question is kind of along the lines of what peter was saying with the hacking and stuff and also with what you were saying about doing client work like bc perry's example like i feel like maybe it wouldn't be a good idea to like take a client brief and put it into chat gpt with potentially confidential information in it like, do you have to be careful about that kind of stuff? Yes. Um, but I want to differentiate. I, I don't mean to be pedantic, but it's really important that I do. So chat GPT is the web browser thing. And then GPTs are these custom things. Like, like just to visually show you, this is chat GPT. And then this is a custom GPT that I wrote about Motley Crude Media. So is that more private then for doing um, like the, the GPT is like the one we're looking at here, right here, the Chris crude bot is more private. If you're able to lock down your information, so it don't get hacked. Like Peter talked about, then it's completely private. Then you, you can control it here. Um, if you don't write your GPT properly, it would be more private using chat GPT than one of these custom GPTs. However, people would say don't put <laughs> secret information in them, <laughs> but I actually don't think you're at risk. If you, if my honest opinion is people would say, don't put trade secrets into your freaking Google search or into your, you know, web browser, chat window, any of that kind of stuff. But I actually personally don't think you're at much of a risk. It, there's not a human looking at that stuff. At best, it gets seen in aggregate and anonymized. I've kind of developed a way of doing what you're describing. You know, I get, I have a lot of different clients. They all have different technical levels or needs. They'll ask me for something where, you know, they're asking for expertise and maybe I have some, maybe I don't, <laughs> hopefully I have some. 
Um, but I'll often write my answer and then put my answer to chat GPT with a persona of the client, not anything real specific, but just, you know, this client is very knowledgeable. They like humor, you know, I need a lengthy answer or a short answer, you know, just things that I would do naturally if I was going to write the answer mm -hmm. along with my own tone. And I'll say, and then I'll ask it, you know, what have I missed? What, what is this person going to ask? that I haven't included that what's the main my point favorite question yeah. to ask AI of all time is what are my blind spots I ask exactly I do every it all day the time. after every conversation <laughs> yeah. I'll sit there and talk to it for two hours and I'll be like okay what am I not even thinking of what am I what are my blind spots that's like my number one question that I ask after a long conversation with it um Susie uh I would have resisted this feedback if someone gave it to me a week ago, but I just dove in again with you guys right here. And I actually built the Chris crew GPT, like in those two and a half minutes while talking to you guys. So I haven't got it all perfect yet, but I noticed it worked. Yeah, no, it, it, <clears throat> it does. You, I was learning how you fed it. I think the scripts are, I was asking it like when you want perspectives, right. From different people. Like if I, I know, want bro, I totally want to show you. I just don't want to embarrass myself by popping over there and not being able to. We can, we can do something. We can do one-on-one. -on -one, that's fine. No, because it's just fascinating because it's more about where, how you teach it, right? And how many things you do have, right? Um, by the way, I tried to do a, a uh, describe yes. and it's tell, on the uh, Discord and it's telling me I need to subscribe to mid, like I need to pay for mid journey. So that is true. That is true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I pay eight bucks a month. Um, yep. Do you use chat GPT? Yes. Extensively. The pro, the pro version. Yes. Cool. You should dolly stuff up then for now, probably. What's that? You should use the dolly inside of GPT for right now then. Yeah. Get some, get some description. Cause I was taking Brett's photo from the, the website to tell me what it's about. And then I can understand and reverse engineer the, the style. Yeah. Do that in GPT. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to do uh, it. Yeah. I was going to show you guys, you know what guys, we got about like 10 minutes left. Uh, in this particular session. So you should fire off questions if you got them and I'll try to kind of like rapid fire answer them. And in the meantime, I'm going to navigate to another thing I want to show you. But what else you guys got for me? Okay, fine then. How would you prompt the, if you put an image in... Dolly, I'm in chat GPT. Yes. It's interesting. Do you use describe? No, you don't have to. You can just talk to it. Here, we'll swap over there and do that too because that's a very common use case for a lot of people. Share screen, browser window. Cool. We in my browser? Yes. We in GPT? Um, also guys here's another real low-hanging fruit tip the gpt mobile app is amazing it uses a, a model called whisper which no you don't need it you can forget about it after i said it but it's it's different than what chat GPT through the web interface uses and its ability to understand what you're saying and talk back and forth to you is incredible. I use it. Sometimes I go on our drives just to do work because you can talk to it and it can talk back to you. So I just put it in my thing and I'm like, let's have a chat. You know, I am headed to New York next week. What places should I check out of those museums? Which are the newest ones? And it's, and it's reading back to me the results. And then also it's maintained as a transcript so when I get back to my computer or wherever else, I grab the whole back and forth transcript I have with the thing and paste it into regular GPT and have it summarized and stuff like that. So here's your um, describe Steve inside GPT instead. Generate a new photo like this, but the man is uh, Ugandan. So I just, I just put it in and I, I said, give me the mid journey prompts for this image. I oh, okay, cool. it. Yeah. 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 I like that. I have GPT write 
text to image prompts for me almost every day too. Like you don't have to write your own image prompts. GPT can write your image prompts for you. Graphic novel illustration, bold colors doesn't, yeah. Perfect, this is great. I wonder what it's gonna come up with. It's a little slow. I do hope, I'm gonna show you guys Poe before we run away. Maybe now's the time to do it, okay. Second, share screen. Oh. Are you guys seeing my thing that says Poe? That's too bad. Okay, let me try more time. There it is. Earlier when I talked about the trillium of AIs, this is what I was talking about. You guys see something called Poe now? All right, yes. cool. So um, we'll start by just looking right here. You see Claude Instant 100K Llama 270B. So Claude is the, let's call it second place uh, competitor of the text generative AIs, but it's the best for writing creative copy I find. And if you haven't paid for a subscription for any of these tools yet, you may choose to pay for your subscription at Poe at first, because with Poe, you get this Claude 2 model as well as the regular Claude, but then you also get... Wow. All these other AIs here. So the one, these are the ones from Facebook. These are free versions of chat GPT, but like there are so many, I want to, where's the Instagram one? Let me see. Let's try this one. Let me see. There we go. Oh, punk. Oh, it only wants JPEGs. One second. It stands for Path of Exile. That's hilarious. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's awesome. been a great class, Chris. Hey, thanks, guys. I'm really glad you came, Steve. I hope everyone got some. I'm going to send you all a survey. So if you know, if you, all the things you loved about this, tell them to the world and all the things you hated to about this, please put it in the survey and send it to me so I can improve. Um, I really wanted to show you that. Uh, so here's another um image creation model, stable diffusion that some people have heard of, Dolly 3, Claude. This is the way to go in, in so many ways, but I'm looking for that Instagram one because some of you marketers will real, get a real quick feel for how awesome these things are. I don't know why it is keep rejecting my file type. I'm sorry. One sec. I must have fucked something up. Anyway, I am going to shut that down and wrap up here with you guys. Um, thanks again for coming. I do hope everyone got a uh, good value out of this. I am going to be doing these things every month. Um, for some of you Vancouver people, I'd encourage you guys to come to the in-person one next one if, time if you can. Um, it'd be fun to spend some time together and we're going to be having the AI meetup after the next Vancouver AI training. So for Vancouver peeps, that'd be fun. Even for some of you Seattle peeps, Steve Broback and some other Seattle peeps are coming up for the one tomorrow. So, um, I'd love if you guys came up, uh, hung out with us during that. And, um, I'm happy to offer you guys. So you're my first 
cohort of this class ever. And I really appreciate it. And so you guys can have 25% off for any classes you ever take with me ever again, forever and ever. Amen. Just cause like, I appreciate you guys taking a risk on me here and probably putting up with a couple little technical glitches and stuff like that. So I really appreciate it. And, um, please join my discord server. Um, I, you know, I want everyone to keep doing trainings with me, but we can train each other on Discord quite easily. And we share a lot of stuff and a lot of the ideas and techniques that I share with the world. Um, I develop there with my colleagues on Discord. And so the way I think of it is if people have like a little bit more time and a little bit more energy, then they can save some money by coming and hanging out on Discord. However, if they kind of like want the summaries of stuff and for me to just be like, tell me everything you learned in the last two months about video AI, then, you know, just getting in on the trainings is a great way to go. I'll show, you know, under the hood and try to provide tools and samples. But now you're connected with me too. And I'm happy to um, answer questions on an ongoing basis and stuff. So that's what I got for you here today. Thanks so much, Chris. That was exactly what I was hoping for. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Helpful. Thank you. Very nice to connect with you, David. Glad to be connected to you, Steve, to you, Chris. Thanks a lot. It was great. Thank you for expanding my mind. Very good. Thank you, guys. I'll talk to you more soon. And Peter and I's class starts right this second.